good morning. My name is Jimmy Van Bramer, and I am very proud to be the chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. I want to welcome you all to our hearing today where we are joining both an oversight uh, committee hearing on uh, upcoming capital projects uh, with libraries, uh, but also hearing uh, two very important uh, pieces of legislation, uh, a resolution and a an introduction, both of which I'll speak uh, to a little bit later. Uh, we're joined by uh, council members uh, Cabrera and Rodriguez, who are uh, uh, either primes or co-primes on those very important pieces of legislation, and both will be speaking. And I know Councilmember Inez Barron is also uh, coming to speak on her uh, very important resolution as well. And we're also joined by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. Uh, and uh, I want to welcome Commissioner Tom Finkelpearl, uh, who is here today and uh, I think some people uh, in the audience know that it was announced this morning that uh, Commissioner Finkel Pearl will be leaving the administration and yes uh, and um, I, I want to say that I have had the privilege of knowing Commissioner Finkel Pearl for uh, 20 some odd years uh, if you know anything about Tom, you know of his incredible work uh, with the Percent for Art program uh, many, many years ago, uh, his work with MoMA PS1, of course his amazing stewardship of the Queen's Museum, uh, the first museum that I ever went to in my life, and of course for nearly six years as our uh, Commissioner of Cultural Affairs. and. Uh, I know, Tom, uh, in your heart that you uh, love artists and support artists, and I know that you believe uh, that every single New Yorker, every single child, every single adult should have equal access to the arts, regardless of uh, the zip code, uh, how much money they may have, their immigration status. Um, and, and I know you to be a fundamentally decent and good human being who cares so deeply about our city and about the arts, so I just want to start by saying thank you, and I know you have a, a couple more months with us. Uh, we may or may not have a hearing uh, at which you testified during that time, so uh, this could be uh, the final time that you testify before the committee. You may be grateful for that, but uh, uh, I want to say thank you on behalf of uh, uh, New Yorkers for your service uh, to the city, and I want to say that publicly uh, right now. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that, Jimmy. Uh, so I, I know that uh, maybe others are just finding this out and, and may want to uh, uh, speak to your, uh, your uh, work and, and, and legacy as well. Um, so to the business at hand, uh, our public library systems uh, are the fundamental bedrock of our society and democracy, I believe, and their 216 uh, or so uh, community libraries throughout the five boroughs uh, really are where uh, New Yorkers, uh, all New Yorkers, uh, go to get their information. Uh, and of course, the, the physical plants, the, the buildings are uh, pretty important. There is no library without uh, library staff, of course. Uh, there is no library without the materials in it that improve people's lives. But the, uh, the uh, physical plant is pretty darn important. Uh, you need libraries uh, that work and serve and improve. And we want to talk a little bit about upcoming uh, capital projects as part of our hearing today. But as I mentioned, uh, we are also hearing uh, some very important pieces of legislation, and I, I, I believe that uh, Councilmember Barron is on her way. But uh, the first is introduction number 1451, uh, a local law in relation to creating a task force to review the feasibility of creating a New York City Museum of African American History that is sponsored by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. 
and uh, I'm going to ask uh, the council member to speak on his intro in a moment. We're also uh, hearing today Resolution 1092 calling upon the president to lift the Cuban embargo and end the Cuban travel ban. Uh, that is sponsored by Council Member Barron, uh, Council Member Rodriguez, who is here, and myself. These are important pieces of legislation uh, uh, that I fully support. So I want to um, thank Commissioner Finkelpearl for being here. Uh, we're going to hear from the three library system uh, heads, uh, including uh, Iris Weinshaw representing the New York Public Library and, uh, and DDC. And then I know there are uh, some folks who have uh, signed up to testify. Um, I'm going to ask my colleagues uh, to say a few words, uh, and then we're going to uh, hear from Commissioner Finkelpearl. Obviously, it's a pretty uh, momentous morning in his life, uh, so we want to be able to give him the opportunity to uh, testify and depart as he needs to. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my legislative director, uh, Jack Bernadovitz, my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, and our committee finance analyst, Alia Ali, our legislative policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and our committee counsel, Nell Beekman, for all their work on this hearing. And at this moment, I will call on Councilmember Cabrera uh, to speak to his very important introduction, number 1451. Thank you uh, to the chair. And uh, Commissioner, I want to wish you the best. I want to join the concert of best wishes uh, to you and the chemistry that uh, Commissioner you have with our wonderful chair uh, who has uh, been a champion. Uh, I was just relating earlier how much he loves this. There are people who chair because they have to and there are chairs that uh, literally love passionately what they do and, and, and the same can be said about you and so you, you guys were both of you the dynamic duo uh, <laughs> making it possible. And so, so with that, let me just uh, thank uh, the chair again uh, and committee members for the opportunity to speak on intro 1451. This bill will create a task force to study the feasibility of creating New York City's first museum dedicated to the history of African Americans in New York. We're a city of numerous cultural institutions and museums so that many so many that it's hard to know exactly how many they are. Maybe you know, Commissioner, uh, or the chair, but we, we looked at it, we, we, even Wikipedia says we're not even exactly sure. But there are many fine cultural and historical venues dedicated to African Americans. There is none that looks at the full historical impact and contributions of African Americans to the city of New York starting with the first enslaved Africans brought to the colony of New Amsterdam in 1626. There is a significant part of our history as New Yorkers missing. Intro 1451 is the first step in correcting this omission. I want to thank Brenda McKinney, counsel to the committee, Christy Dwyer, policy analyst, <coughs> and the staff of the legislative division for their work on this bill and uh, my director of legislation, Claire McLevay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Um, uh, we are still awaiting uh, Councilmember Barron as the prime sponsor, but I'm very proud to join with uh, Councilmember Rodriguez on supporting Reso 1092. Uh, and I want to ask uh, Councilmember Rodriguez as a co-prime sponsor on the resolution to lift the Cuban embargo and end the Cuban travel pan ban. Uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. First of all, uh, thank you to the advocate that has been organizing around this resolution, especially those from neighbors. John Gibbs, who couldn't be here, uh, uh, she's in the international conference happening these days. The person who in 1989, when she was a lawyer, represents me when I was arrested for the first time at 181st and San Nicolas Avenue. So there's a lot of things that we have in common between the advocate and those of us here that I would say they had not been a better time in the city of New York with a more progressive group of council members than the one that we have today. So when, when, when we look at, you know, the need to put pressure to lift up the embargo, there's not a better city than the city of New York that should be leading that. 
we as a city, regardless if in D.C., sometimes we have presidents from the George Bush and others that focus on invading and creating war through the embargoes, or today, the guy that we have today, New York City having a standing shoulder to shoulder from the academic, the cultural institution, the activists. Not only we brought Fidel Castro to the convention center, and we brought him to the Bronx, and brought him to Harlem, but also there's a lot that has happened between New York City and Cuba. So today, we are welcome, you know, everyone to this hearing. And again, thank you to the chair, the Lee Prime, Council Member Byron, myself, and Jimmy, that we understood that this is the time. We need to take this fight, not only throughout the city, but through DC. And, you know, as a co prime of this bill, I believe that when we look at where we are today, there's a lot that we have to do. The Congress should do the right thing, they should lift the embargo and end the travel ban against the people of Cuba. The ban has gone through many stages in transformation throughout the years. Just this week, Trump administration banned all flight to Cuban cities with the section of Havana. In his last move to roll back the easing of relationship of the Obama era. The embargo set on 1961, shortly after the revolution takeover of Fidel Castro was implemented as a measure to penalize the Cuban government. As we know, the embargo has only served to punish the Cuban people who have suffered incredible hardship for decades. <coughs> it has also hindered our ability to interact with the Cuban nation on all aspects of cultural, educational, financial, and trade relations. It is 2019 and many of the policies set by long past administration have changed, and that's so unfortunately, and that's the effort to, put, to bring our nation back, and we should move forward. The Cuban embargo is a relic of the Cold War years, which has no benefit to United States security or economic interests. It is time we get rid of a policy that only serves to harm us all. Today, we are calling on the United States Congress to write a new page in the history of the American foreign policy by restoring our relationship with Cuba. We owe it to the Cuban and the American people. Hoy estamos pidiendo un embargo, donde eh, que se termine el embargo, eh, gracias al liderazgo de Jimmy como chairman de este comité, eh, el liderazgo de líderes sindicales, activistas, estamos diciendo, El embargo es una extensión de la guerra fría que debe determinarse, eh, reintrige las relaciones, no solamente con gobierno, sino cultural, académica y económica. Nosotros hoy pedimos de que el Congreso de los Estados Unidos, este presidente, cambie lo que trata de hacer con mantener un embargo que es injusto, es inmoral y separa. Es una forma de crear también eh, puentes y barreras que lo que hacen es dividir las naciones. Thank you. And Majority Leader Kumba, would you like to uh, say a few words? I will keep my remarks brief because we want to hear your statement and obviously we want to get directly to questions. But I just want to thank you for your leadership over the last six years. I've been so impressed with um, being able to work collaboratively with you. Um, it means so much to me, the work that we did for Weeksville and making sure that Weeksville became a part of the CIG program, the expansion for the Percent for Art program, being able to work collaboratively to expand the amount of public art that's throughout the city, and of course being able to include women um, and people of color in terms of how we publicly recognize people of color throughout the city of New York, the increases to the budget uh, to make sure that we are able to serve more organizations throughout uh, the city of New York. And I really just thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. I don't know who we are going to beat up on the way that we did for the last six years. And I can't believe that you're leaving. And it's our sixth year. And I've kind of, after these six years, gotten you right where I want you. I mean, to be able to work collaboratively. And um, you're certainly going to be missed. And your legacy and what you've been able to accomplish throughout 
uh, the city of New York. So many capital projects that have been realized, um, so many capital projects that I pushed to make happen. Um, it's really gonna be a, a loss to not have you as part of this administration, but your legacy will continue throughout the city of New York, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I also wanna just add that uh, you will depart the administration at a moment where there is record funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs, and that is something that will always be a part of your legacy. Uh, we have had substantial increases over the last few years. Uh, we will continue to push for more uh, for uh, culture and, and the arts, but uh, you, you not only we're given the task of uh, implementing the cultural plan and, and making sure that that happened and then following it up with some meaningful resources behind those initiatives. Uh, and you, you led all of that work. So I, I firmly believe that you've been a, a terrific and successful commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs. And, uh, and uh, time will, and history will treat you well. Uh, I firmly believe that. So uh, I want to thank you again for everything you've done uh, and obviously our partnership, not just here in these roles, but when I was at the Queen's Public Library and you were at the Queen's Museum and when we started our uh, working together and friendship. So uh, thank you for all of that. And with that, I'll hand it over to the council as to swear you in for your testimony. Please raise your right hand. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, so I just, I'll say before I read my testimony that actually three out of four of you I've worked with very closely. And I, I knew council member Van Bramer and Combo when they were not yet council members. We started our dialogue a long time ago and it's gonna continue in the future. Councilmember Rodriguez, we have had a wonderful um, collaboration up in your district, so we haven't worked together, but good luck in the future. I guess I just want to say thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure, and uh, you know, I'm not going to leave New York City, but a uh, couple more months of this, and yeah, it is my <laughs> perhaps my last hearing. So we'll take it, see what happens. Okay, I'm gonna start my testimony. Good morning, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. I am Tom Finkelpearl, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. I'm here to testify in regards to intro 1451 of, tw of 2019, a proposed local law in relation to the SIP, in relation to establishing a task force to review the feasibility of creating the New York City Museum of African American History. I'm joined by a number of my colleagues from the agency let me begin by saying that we believe in African American history is New York City history. Even though we're a northern state, slavery wasn't fully abolished in New York State until 1827. Four years ago, New York City's main 18th century slave market was uh, marked with a plaque unveiled by Mayor de Blasio just a few blocks from here. Both before and after slavery uh, was abolished in New York, black residents were very much part of this city. Only last week, new interpretive signage commemorating Seneca Village in Central Park was installed. The legacy of free black community of Weeksville uh, in present day central Brooklyn is kept alive by Weeksville Cultural Center, which is on the path to becoming the first new member of the cultural institution group in a generation. And black communities across the city, from the Bronx to Staten Island, are central to New York City's status as a center, not just of black culture, but world culture. Numerous monuments, statues, organizations, and institutions are dedicated to preserving and promoting this rich living history that continues to unfold today. We are committed, while we are committed to supporting the organizations and communities doing important work, we have some uh, concerns about the proposed bill. As we understand it, the legislation proposed the creation of a task force to examine the possibility of creating New York City Museum of African American History. The task force would comprise, comprise 11 members and exist for 12 months. The group would meet quarterly and hold at least two public meetings to seek comment on the establishment of the proposed museum. The task force would consider feasibility, possible sites, outreach and education needs, and city coordination, ultimately producing a report with, it, with its findings and recommendations. DCLA, which is the second largest funder of public funder of culture in America after the federal government, provides funding to private nonprofit cultural organizations. 
We fund over 1,000 groups annually, including many dedicated to African American culture and history. By and large, these organizations were not created through this sort of city-led, top-down approach proposed in legislation, which is more akin to how the Smithsonian institution, the federal government, uh, creates institutions. In that case, the federal government builds, staff, and operates the institutions. Since the very first members of the Cultural Institution Group came online 150 years ago, New York City has a public-private approach to supporting its cultural community and has helped to foster the astonishingly diverse and dynamic cultural sector we have today. The Department of Cultural Affairs has concerns about the top-down approach of the creation of a new cultural institution. For one, DCLA is not structurally set up to take on financial and operational support that seems to be implied in the bill. And past experience shows that this is not necessarily the best way to create a sustainable cultural institution. A community-based approach is much more effective than city-led, top-down approach. To reiterate something I said earlier, we're incredibly proud of New York City's cultural organizations dedicated to exploring and promoting uh, creative vitality, cultural heritage, and rich history of African Americans here in New York City and beyond. From Studio Museum and Schomburg Center in Harlem to Mokata uh, and Weeksville in Brooklyn, uh, exploring black African American and African diaspora experience is uh, an artistry. They were created by and for communities they serve, and we are honored uh, to collaborate with and support them in producing a vast range of public programming. We share the Council's commitment to supporting groups that honor rich culture of African Americans in New York City. As public servants, of course, we are happy to provide guidance and expertise to community groups and others interested in learning more about operating cultural organizations city support and other resources available to them. We look forward to discussing with you additional ways in which we might be able to partner together to build upon the great work that is being done. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on today's topic, and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, I know because Councilmember Cabrera has sponsored this and feels uh, so passionately about, him, uh, about this that he has uh, questions, and I'm gonna defer to him uh, yes. on questions on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner, I appreciate uh, what you share, um, but uh, regarding this top-down approach, but the reason why we need a top-down approach is because we haven't funded the up, the down-up approach, the grassroots. Matter of fact, I, if I could be so blunt, when I walked in here this morning, I didn't see a lot of people of color in this room. Uh, most of the cultural institutions are not represented uh, by people of color. Uh, people who have tried to start those have not uh, been duly funded uh, through for many, many, many years. So when we had years and years where uh, African American cultural institutions had not been duly funded, and I'm not talking about perhaps recent efforts, I, and thank God for our, our chair and, and this committee and, and yourself, but for many, many, many years, they were neglected, they were not heard, uh, they were not, they didn't receive the funding they had. How in the world were they supposed to do that when we see other organizations that they got the sort of funding that came from the city and they could expand and attract philanthropists, they will have that base of operation to be able to attract. So for, for that reason, I felt compelled, and not just myself, but uh, other members, uh, that you know, felt compelled that we needed to do this in this approach because then we'll be sitting here waiting another 50 years before we have an African-American embassy in New York City. Uh. Is there a question in Yeah, so the question yeah. is, based on that context, how do we expect it to happen? And I, I guess what, what I hear you saying is you expect it to happen organically. And it hasn't happened organically, and I don't see it happening organically anytime soon because uh, uh, where the streams of funding, and this is all about funding at the end of the day. Yeah, so I mean, look, I first of all, if this is to happen, I think it's a great idea that this museum exists, but I'm just saying that there's a different approach. The Smithsonian Institution uh, in Washington, D.C. is the closest thing we have to the European model of how cultural organizations operate in, in, in America. And that European model is that they're truly public institutions. When you walk in the door, 
you know, of a museum in Europe or in Washington, D.C., first of all, the museums are almost all free, and second of all, those are public employees that meet you at the door. In New York City, it's a public-private model that has been going on for a very long period of time, which is that, you know, they're private nonprofit organizations, some of which are on city property and some of which are uh, completely independent. And the way that we're set up to work is that an organization, let's say that this organization becomes a 501c3 nonprofit, even if it doesn't have a large, extensive operational history, that it comes into the system, that it begins to uh, do programming. That's the point at which the policy of a city has been to say we can be begin to fund it, to begin to, let's say, uh, fund it for capital money, et cetera. So it's not that an organization has to become a full-blown museum before it gets city support. There are lots of steps along the way. Uh, we're just, I'm just saying from the point of view of cultural affairs, from the point of view of the policy, which I think is a good policy, uh, if you look at Weeksville, you look at Makata, look at the organizations uh, that have been making their way up through this system, I think it is possible to do one step at a time. So we're advocating that if, if this uh, goes forward, that the organization first becomes, if, that there is an organization, that becomes a nonprofit. As I understand it, there's no nonprofit organization that we're talking about right now. So anyway, that's my uh, position, and I understand that's not your position. So uh, I just want to understand. I just want to make sure they understand yeah. what you're saying. Are, 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 you, are you in opposition or having a task force? So I, yeah, I mean, I, my belief is that the best way to operate is to see if, there, if an organization uh, can organically be created to have a 501c3 status and then go through the process that's been you know, tried and true over many years. That's my opinion that that's the best way to operate because then there's an actual nonprofit that has a mission that's clear what it wants that has a sort of sense of idea of where it should be in the city and that's the point at which uh, I think that the city should get involved in possibly supporting this at a major scale. But the scale. whole point of the task force is to see the feasibility to see how it will work best is, is not to come up even with a nonprofit, and right. and and, and the, the way, uh, as I understand, you're presenting it, who, who will get to choose that nonprofit? Uh, we don't have a, a process in place. We don't have any legislation related to that. So that's why I thought the task force would be best because that might be one of the suggestions that they come forth. And, and yeah. So, but I'm mean, look. If just we don't. The city doesn't have the capacity to do strategic planning for the creation of a cultural institution. That's not something we've done before. There are, you know, organizations out there. There are these planning firms. There are uh, strategic plan, you know, facility master planning firms, et cetera, like that. So it's just not, I don't see the capacity, certainly within my agency, to, let's say, do planning uh, around the creation of a cultural institution. That's all I'm saying. It, so your office don't, can, can we get funding to make sure the task force will have the ability uh, to do a thorough feasibility study? I mean, we do that with just about everything else that we do here, so. So again, look, I mean, I'm saying that the way that what we support or what we think is the best uh, avenue is that, that you have nonprofits, that you, uh, that those organizations, if there is uh, the energy around this, that that organization is formed and that that organization then comes forth to the city is saying, we have a proposal. We want to make this work. And then, you know, there's, you know, that they could uh, apply for funding, let's say, for if they're doing business, they come into our um, uh, portfolio, they could begin to get funding from the city. And you know, obviously there are a lot of uh, nonprofit, I mean sort of uh, foundation funders who are very interested right now in feasibility studies and master planning. So I think it's very fundable. There are organizations that actually focus on that, certain uh, have nonprofits. You ever, yeah. Have you ever had uh, in the last six years uh, anybody approach you with a project of, of this magnitude? So, I mean, organizations have come to us and said, we would like to establish a museum for X, Y, and Z. And some, it's been everything from bicycles, honestly. There was a, it was a bicycle museum possibility. Um, 
to other you know, uh, uh, proposals, yeah. So there yeah, have no, been but proposals. I'm specifically to an African American. So I've, have, I've have spoken to one gentleman who had this proposal uh, or had this idea. I'm not sure if it's the same idea or from the same impetus. And I, I really said very some, something quite similar to this gentleman who, who I spoke with a couple of times on the phone, which was to say, you know, if there is a, so who is, who am I talking to? Is there a nonprofit organization? Is there a board? Do you have a mission? Uh, and the answer to all that was no, we have this, I have this basic idea to do this. So I'm not sure if this is coming from the same impetus mm -hmm. uh, or not. This could be a completely independent. Uh, uh. Well, I don't want to take much uh, time here as chair, but I, I, I firmly believe we need a task force. I, we need something that is structured, something that has a beginning and the end, something, uh, a, a process in place that uh, is not left to just one group, and just one nonprofit, but to be able to have different voices coming together uh, because it's a city-wide uh, project uh, with many people that have many, many ideas. And I think uh, putting those minds together and to come up with something at the end that might include uh, the processes that you're, you're mentioning, uh, I think that it will make the, the projects uh, stronger. Uh, we we'll look to love to continue this dialogue, uh, Commissioner. I know you leave in a couple of weeks, but uh, also uh, with your staff. Thank you so much, and thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I too, I just want to reiterate a point that Councilmember Cabrera was making because I understand some of the uh, issues that you raise, but we are talking about a task force to look at the feasibility of creating a New York City Museum of African American History. What is the harm in creating a task force to consider the feasibility of building a museum that we all agree needs to be built? So I'm, um, look, I'm, this will be my successor's question for sure. Sure. But I, I'm saying that, that this model that you're talking about is very familiar to me as the model of the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian, I'm sure, had a task force in the creation of, of their uh, Museum of African American History and Culture. They built the building, they staff it, they run it. That is a federal um, impetus. Yeah, I mean, there's private funding in there, of course, but it is a public museum, and this, that again, in that European model, it was planned by the government and it's run by the government. What I'm saying is we have a hybrid model here, which is really halfway in a way between the European model and the American model, but that the impetus for something like this in, in usually comes from the private sector, from a group of people who uh, mobilize around an idea. And this is, again, I mean, we have a, a, a woman at your table who mobilized an organization, created a nonprofit from scratch. Uh, with, I'm talking about Mokata, obviously, and Lori Cumbo. Um, that's the normal way it works. It shows uh, community support. It shows uh, uh, capacity. And, and that, that kind of bubbling up of um, uh, ideas is the way that I support and our agency supports doing it. So I hear what you're saying, but if it's not happening that way, then does not the city of New York have an obligation to actually step up in the creation of a museum that the city of New York has a vested interest in making sure actually happens. I understand how you, you believe it should happen, yeah. um, but if for whatever reason it's not happening in the way that you think it should happen, shouldn't the city of New York take a much more proactive role in making sure that it happens? Because I believe the city of New York should have the position that this museum must be in existence, right? It absolutely has to exist. You started your testimony off by right. sort of saying that. But then if it's not happening, I, I think what Council Member Cabrera is getting at is, well, let's at least put together a task force to talk about the feasibility, which means how's the best way to do it, what do we do, and at least put the city of New York on notice that this is, in fact, something we have to pursue. 
Look, I mean, I think I've expressed my opinion that I think that the, 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 uh, the model of, in a way, doing uh, the planning around the creation of cultural institution from scratch is, is not something that the city has done in the past. It doesn't mean it can't be done in the future. But that the best model, in my opinion, the opinion of the agency, is to uh, support organizations that already exist as nonprofits. Again, it doesn't have to be, um, it can be something it builds over a period of time. So I, I think that, that's, that having it work that way is the best model. It's a model that's worked for the city. And that, you know, that's the opinion. I understand your uh, opinion as well. That's, I mean, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, obviously, this is a discussion that will be ongoing with the department. Uh, and uh, any future uh, commissioners and, of course, the administration. I know that uh, Majority Leader Combo has some questions as well. Thank you. I, I think you can imagine that I'd have a little interest in this topic. I'm <laughs> fully prepared to, to believe that. So when we look at the Smithsonian model and we look at uh, the National African American Museum, right? So we look at when that museum opened, it opened and in three months, 600,000 people came to visit that museum, right? And then by 2018, the museum had received five million visitors from all over the world that came to visit this particular museum and the investment that the federal government made, and this museum which inspired me ultimately to found my own institution, this road began in the 1970s. So it took from the 1970s to 2018 for it actually to become a reality, to locate the space, to raise the funding, but ultimately to have a legislature that would believe that this would be important. So when the city of New York is planning culturally, to have five million visitors come to the city of New York <clears throat> that would impact hotels, transportation, public transportation, restaurants, small businesses. When we look at that type of investment, does the city ever look at how to bring revenue into the city utilizing cultural institutions as a viable way to do that? Because to bring five million people to New York City for a cultural experience is, if, 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 if you're only looking at the economics of it versus the cultural impact of it, and that's just one way we're looking at it, does the city not find that to be a viable investment in terms of bringing revenue, job creation, and everything else to the city? So first of all, I'm one of those people who's been to that museum a number of times. It's a fantastic place. It has, Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, so, but again, the model there is different from the model here. That is a federal museum that is run by the government, mm -hmm. uh, that has been planned by the government. And again, that's not the way we have done business here. Again, you know, that uh, is, so the Smithsonian Institution is 80% publicly funded and 20% mm -hmm. privately funded. Mm -hmm. The Cultural Institution Group, which is, the, by the way, has about the same attendance as the Smithsonian, is the flip side, which is 20% on average, 22% publicly funded and 78% privately funded. So what you end up with is organizations that have to, in a way, be able to stand on their own feet with private funding, even if you're a CIG, which is the best deal that you have in terms of supporting. So again, that idea of, of, of the top-down planning that happened for that museum, which is the, true for other new Smithsonian's as well, makes sense for an organization that will be essentially funded by the public. I'm saying to demonstrate some capacity as a 501c3 nonprofit to say, we're here, we have an idea, we have a mission, is the direction, I think. And I also just, you know, this is the same thing with capital projects. I always think there has to be an institution with a vision to create a capital project. You should not build a museum and then have the director and the staff move into it. And so psychologically or, or sort of conceptually, that's what we're talking about here which is to create a structure and then build the staff into it. We have, uh, in the situation of Studio Museum, folks like Mary Schmidt Campbell, who are the architects of an idea that is now bearing fruit 50 years later with a new building on 125th Street with Thelma Golden at the helm, but it was imagined by people like Mary. And you created Mokata, 
with a vision of what it needed to be. I'm saying that we need that visionary leader who is an arts and culture person, a history person, who is the helm of an organization, even if it's a very nascent organization. I think that's the best model. I'm sort of repeating myself, but I'm just trying to flesh it out a bit with some examples. Okay, let me come at it another angle. So segregation ended in this country around 1964, where it ended throughout our local and state uh, municipalities all throughout the country. So that's, that's a little less than 55 years ago. So when you look at African American culture and you're looking at the time that we came to this country, it was 400 years of a decimation of a people on all levels. To, to bring up financially would be silly. I'm talking more about your cultural, your race, your religion, your identity, your name, a total decimation and a wipeout of a culture that was in many ways um, upon the ending of slavery meant to self-destruct in a way and left to its own devices to do that. So if we go to 1964 and then we fast forward, it's only 55 years. So the way that the city of New York looks at funding cultural institutions is saying there was a European, now white America, that benefited from 400 years of free labor and then 55 years later we're saying, okay, you should all be at the same space, you should all be at the same place, you should have all gotten all your wealth together in these 55 years, we're gonna start a race for resources, go, right? And that's unrealistic, because to talk about public and private partnerships, for me to create Mokata and for uh, the founders of the Studio Museum and now at the helm of Thelma Golden, the ability for, and, and let's just say these are artistic cultural spaces, not historical institutions like uh, the Philadelphia African American Museum or uh, other museums uh, by Margaret Burroughs out in Washington, excuse me, in Chicago at the DuSable. These are historical institutions. New York City does not have a historical institution. So the challenge that we have as people of color is that when you talk about private par and public partnerships, we don't have, and it should be reflected in an understanding in the city, we don't have the same base of uh, dispendable income. We don't have the same base of uh, savings. We don't have the same base of deep pockets. And those rooms where all of that negotiating and who gets the funding and those $10,000 a plate dinners, people of color are generally not in those spaces and in those rooms. I was fortunate in many ways to have people, I guess in some ways, look favorably upon me and say, I'll invite you to the $10,000 plate dinner, I'll pay for you, or I'll invite you, but those were, in some ways, people having a level of sympathy for me to say, I know you can't get in these rooms, I know you can't negotiate with these people, I'll bring you in the room so that you can negotiate and you can meet these people. Those are anomaly situations, it's not really a model. So the concept of this task force, and uh, you're speaking about a as we've always done business approach. We've always done it this way, but as we've always done it this way, it has not yielded the result that we want. I believe this task force is important to look at a, a top-down and a down-up approach, and somehow we meet in the middle, recognizing that all people are not I would say we're all created equal, but once we get here on the earth, you inherit a very different history and culture and financial capacity once you get here. We have to recognize that as a city. We have to recognize that not everyone is starting at the same place and do something proactively about it versus falling into the, this is how we've always done business and this is how it should always go. So I think that you're, uh, um, yeah. That was great. Uh, I, I think that, <laughs> by the way, my possible last <laughs> council hearing, it's like, yeah, this is what we do, right? Um, you're talking about the difference between equity and equality, right? right. So if you say, but I, I agree with that, and I think the thing is that we've really been focused, and I think that, you know, what you and, and the administration, everybody did with Weeksville is to say, let's put a foundation down there for future permanence uh, in the CIG, it, you know, that, that assuming 
climate change doesn't destroy the city, 150 years from now, Weeksville will still be a CIG, mm -hmm. right? That kind of permanence. I agree, and look, I think that the administration has focused on an equitable approach to funding, trying to change the formulas, trying to open doors, trying to make sure the capital budget, and you guys have done the same thing in this very progressive city council, to focus on building that studio museum, building, finding a permanent home for Mokata, for you know, making Weeksville a CIG. Now, a lot of stuff has been done, um, you know, the National Black Theater, et cetera. So, and you know, I think you can look across different uh, sectors in terms of places in the city, um, that there is an equity approach. I'm really, in a way, just talking about the first step. And, and you're proposing a first step that's a different first step than what I'm proposing. And the first step that I'm proposing isn't one that requires huge amounts of financial stability or lots of money. It's simply the creation of an organization to say, there's an organization which has a vision. And I'm just saying I think that's the best first step. I understand what you're saying. Business as usual is not a good excuse. And I, I don't really think that, I mean, maybe that is how you interpret what I'm saying. But I'm saying that I think that that idea of working with an organization that has some um, structure to it, that has been formed, is my idea the first step. And I know you don't agree. I think that, again, I think that both things can happen. Because this task force, in terms of identifying a historical institution, is important. But we also have to recognize that the cultural institutions of color um, that are in existence, and I'll be perfectly frank with you, knowing most of these institutions, with let's say the exception of the Studio Museum, which is a CIG and has had that status for some time, most of these organizations are one grant missing from closing their doors. So if one grant decides, you know, oh, we don't like you anymore, oh, that exhibition didn't meet our standards, oh, we have a new director who has another vision, we're gonna pull that $150,000, means that some of these organizations are going to close. If you were to look at the financial health of each of these organizations and to look at their endowments, to look at their giving from their board members and the public, you would find organizations that are not financially healthy. So it's important that we recognize that 55 years is certainly not enough time for all of these organizations and the communities and the cultures and the deep pockets to recognize that this rubric is the rubric that's needed in order to fund these institutions. So I would hope that you would consider looking at the viability of the institutions that are already there, recognizing that 55 years is certainly not ample time in order to be able to have a whole city or nation recognize that there needs to be a different type of investment to shore up these institutions because it simply hasn't been enough time for us to compete with our white counterparts in all things being fair and equal. So I, I just want to close my comments with that and, and hope that as you begin to exit that this task force would be a major part of your legacy that everybody would read in every bio moving <laughs> forward when they talk about Tom Finkelpearl. Okay, and just to be a little sentimental, that was a perfect Lori Cumbo ending, <laughs> which is the thing that enlists you into her cause as the hero, right? So I just look, I want to thank, are we finished or you're going to... You have more questions. <laughs> I was going to say one more thing, okay. but if uh, uh, you want to say something. I'll say one, yeah, one yeah. thing, just like, um, I'm so honored to have been across the table from you all for these five and a half, six years, and I think we've accomplished a lot together. I think the budgets have been amazing because of what people have fought for. I think equity has come to the front page. I'm all for this idea that this museum could exist in the future. I think that that's the, the great thing about what's been going on is we all have the same values. The question is how to get there. So we, you know, maybe we argue over this stuff, maybe the task force happens in, with my successor, but I just wanna say what an honor it has been to be at these council hearings, even when I get yelled at or whatever, and thank you so much for allowing me to do that. Well, I was gonna ask you another really tough question, and then you went and said really nice things about us, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right, it's all right. <laughs> okay. and that was like your, your closing statement of your career. How could I mess that up with like a tough question? You can come back with another one.
I will just say this. I believe that we will follow up very strongly with the mayor of the city of New York okay. and this administration who absolutely should uh, end their opposition to a task force uh, for a feasibility study about this museum. And the city of New York has to take a much, much, much more aggressive and proactive approach to making this a reality because uh, of everything you've just heard. Uh, Having said that, I will also say it has been an honor and a privilege uh, to be uh, the chair of this committee for the last uh, 10 years, but for the last six, we have worked together. Uh, and um, again, it is, it is not an easy role. It is sometimes adversarial, but I do very much embrace what you said about our shared values. and. Uh, there's been so much accomplished over the last six years where we have all worked together to make sure that culture and the arts was prioritized. And I'll just say, I don't think that was always easy. Um, I don't think that was always easy for you. I think we pushed really, really hard, um, but I know that you were pushing on the inside as well. And um, different mayors have different priorities and different areas of focus and interest. And, and I think we all, you and I, and this committee uh, made sure, and the various speakers uh, made sure that culture and the arts was a priority, that it got additional funding, that we were able to achieve all of these great things together. So um, I know we will continue uh, uh, our dialogue and we will continue to work together, uh, maybe in different capacities in the future, but. Uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Commissioner Finkelpearl. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And with that, we will uh, allow Commissioner Finkelpearl to uh, move on and call the three library systems. Oh, that's nice. Uh, uh, we have Dennis Walcott from the Queens Public Library, Linda Johnson from the Brooklyn Public Library and Iris Weinshaw from the New York Public Library. If you all would take your seats, we will begin that portion and we will then go back to the public testimony on the introduction and the resolutions uh, as well and hope to still be joined by Councilmember Barron uh, to speak on the Cuban embargo resolution. But we will hear from the three library systems Wow, <laughs> I just turned my head for a second and things happen here. Wow. That may demand an Instagram post, Linda Johnson. Who's gonna go first? Smile, Linda, you're on Instagram. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Who's going first? Okay. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Go ahead, Linda. Great. Good morning, everyone. Happy Halloween. Chairman Von Bramer, Majority Leader Combo and members of the committee, thank you for your ongoing commitment to our city's public libraries and for holding this oversight hearing. I'm Linda Johnson, I'm president and CEO of Brooklyn Public Library. Libraries are vital for our city. We are the ultimate democratic space 
doors open wide to accommodate everyone for free, and we are grateful to you and to the speaker and to the mayor for your outstanding work to help us meet the challenge of providing the best possible service to the public. With your help, the city made significant investments in library infrastructure, and we are beginning to reap the benefit. Brooklyn Public Library is amid our most significant era of rebuilding in history, as one-third of our branches will be renovated or reconstructed over the next five years. Across the borough, we are improving neighborhood libraries with projects ranging from small restorations to full-scale renovations. There is considerable, considerable progress to report on today, even as we face substantial capital needs. In addition to renovation projects in every part of the borough, we have built partnerships to fund them and help provide interim service, undertaken extensive community engagement, reduced our carbon footprint, and begun new projects to complement our building upgrades. Without the city's continued support, this would not be possible. I'm excited to share that Brooklyn Public Library is adding its first new branch in more than 35 years. Adams Street Library will be our 60th branch located, <coughs> located on the Brooklyn waterfront. For the first time, residents of Vinegar Hill, Dumbo, and Farragut will have a local branch. The library will be stocked with books, meeting rooms, and programming space for children, teens, and adults. Like so many of the projects you will hear about today, we undertook an extensive community engagement process, holding public design sessions and town halls to ensure that the space and its program are designed to meet neighborhood needs and priorities. We expect you to be cutting the ribbon a year from now, and I hope we will see you there. In just a few months, Greenpoint residents will be welcomed back to a stunning new facility. The Greenpoint Library and Environmental Education Center has been completely rebuilt from the ground up and will offer increased indoor and outdoor space, expanded programs, and special collections. Funded collectively by the Greenpoint Community Environmental Fund, the State Education Department, State Assembly, and the City, our new branch is a model of sustainable development exceeding LEED Gold Building certification requirements. In fact, across our branches and renovations, we aim to be stewards of the environment by saving energy and lowering emissions. We have reduced our emissions of greenhouse gases by 40% since 2006, avoiding the equivalent of the carbon dioxide released from burning 3.8 million pounds of coal. Traditional lighting has been replaced with LED at 45 branches, and we have installed 22 smart systems to better manage heat, light, and air conditioning, as well as upgrading uh, 30 HVAC systems. In Crown Heights, a new library space is being created through an innovative partnership that is also saving us money. We will relocate the existing Brower Park Library in the Brooklyn Children's Museum, avoiding an $8 million renovation and creating a new branch designed in consultation with the community. Our success is possible thanks to the Council, the Brooklyn Children's Museum, and investments from the mayor and borough president. The final designs are well received, work is under the way, underway, and the branch will open next winter. The Brooklyn Heights and Sunset Park communities will soon benefit from the completion of larger and inspiring new libraries. Brooklyn Heights Library will open in late 2020, and Sunset Park Library follows in 2021. Strong partnerships are also enabling us to turn an infrastructure project at Walt Whitman Library into a comprehensive building renovation. Initially scoped to replace the HVAC system, address fire safety, and accessibility, the project now includes a new garden space, exterior restoration, and interior upgrades. Funded by the city and proceeds from our Brooklyn Heights Library redevelopment, we procured additional funds through the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, working with the state and the borough president. Qualifying for funding allows for a much needed interior renovation and reconfiguration of the main floor and meeting room. And thanks to Majority Leader Cumbo's allocation in the last budget, we will have a dedicated spe teen space for young adults in the community. 
comprehensive $20 million branch overhauls are underway at five libraries. Projects at Eastern Parkway, New Lots, Canarsie, Brownsville, and New Utrecht libraries demonstrate the importance of being included in the city's 10-year capital plan. Full-scale renovations like these are only possible because of a one-time inclusion of funds provided five years ago. Additionally, in a process new to our DDC-managed projects, Eastern Parkway, Brownsville, and New Utrecht Library are developing the plans for these spaces, guided by an interactive public session and design charrettes. Stakeholder engagements help us draw inspiration from local community members, incorporating neighborhood desires while maintaining the core role of the library. The overhaul of New Lots Library, for example, will highlight the significance of the area's once unacknowledged African burial ground. Council Member Barron's additional $6 million allocation to the project, our single largest ever from a council member, will help us deliver a fully updated state-of-the-art library for East New York that builds on the site's rich history. Our most ambitious project, though, is the sorely needed renovation of Central Library on Grand Army Plaza. As our largest and most visited branch, we are undertaking the logistical challenge, some could call that a nightmare, of renovating the 352,000 square foot and 78-year-old building without any closures. Working with internationally renowned Toshiko More architects, we will modernize the building, make more areas accessible to the public, and allow Central Library to better meet the needs of its millions of users while restoring its original historic character. Thanks to a $25 million allocation from the city, the project is moving forward. Throughout these renovations, our priority is always to ensure that the public has uninterrupted access to our material and services whenever possible. Fresh thinking about how to provide interim service enables us to minimize the impact of long-term branch closures. Our librarians have strong relationships in their communities, so in many cases, we have been able to work with local partners to host off-site library programming offering small dedicated collections and computer services in affected neighborhoods. Two weeks ago, East Flatbush Library staff opened a pop-up library to minimize the impact of their closed branch on the neighborhood. Three days a week, we offer services including printing, internet access, and a small collection of books in a free dedicated space at Brookdale Hospital. This project known as Library in Transit will serve as a vital resource while the branch undergoes a comprehensive renovation over the next year. And thanks to a partnership with Bro Brooklyn Bridge Park, we are opening a, te opening a temporary outpost at 1 John Street to serve patrons while the new Adams Street Library is under construction. It will be called the BPL Annex. It will include a laptop loan program, a small collection, and a place for patrons to pick up books on hold. Additional programming for children, teens, and adults will be phased in over time. Likewise, we count on our bookmobile fleet to help provide relief to patrons when a neighborhood branch is closed. So if we are reinventing our, bookmob uh, we are reinventing our bookmobile service, replacing the aging fleet, and creating a new service delivery model. Next fall, we will put a new custom-designed tech mobile on the road, funded by Borough President Eric Adams, it will offer additional computers, technology, and programming to patrons who rely heavily on the library for access to technology. During upcoming branch closures, our bookmobiles will not only bring a circulating collection relevant to the neighborhood, but also offer patrons the opportunity to pick up books they requested from the online catalog. Our renewed fleet will offer a walk-up service model, incorporating space on sidewalk for patrons to browse mobile book displays under a protective canopy, pick up a hold, get a library card, or work with staff through a service window on the side of the vehicle. Everyone is welcome in our libraries. However, many buildings ex building exteriors do not convey that message. So we are developing a new initiative to eliminate defensive architecture without compromising safety. By removing outdated security me measures like fences and window gates, and adding new features like lighting, signage, security cameras, landscaping, and potentially outdoor furniture, bike racks, and book drops, 
we will create a more inviting environment. Budget permitting, we aim to, to pilot these enhancements at select libraries, assess their impact, and develop standards to guide future upgrades for all of our branches. This is a transformational period for Brooklyn's libraries. For the first time in more than 50 years, Brooklyn is adding new and improved spaces to our portfolio, modern and inspirational facilities able to support the countless ways people use libraries today. Your assistance brought us to this point. Over the last five years, the city budget has included funding to begin addressing deferred maintenance projects, project shortfalls, and to embark on some new and exciting projects. These investments are crucial, and we are relying on you to help us maintain and increase them. At the end of last fiscal year, Brooklyn Public Library was fortunate to have DDC, a DDC engineering firm conduct physical needs assessments at five of our buildings. These reports detailed the upgrades necessary to bring the buildings into a state of good repair with real-time cost estimates for the extensive work. Their figures starkly illustrate this desperate need for robust capital funding. Today, we face shortfalls of nearly $27 million over 12 projects throughout the borough. We are forced to assign the bulk of the unallocated capital funding we receive each year, keeping projects initiated years ago moving forward. Awaiting the budget outcome to determine which projects can advance and which will stall is inefficient, more costly, and hampers our ability to serve the public. We must be able to plan future projects beyond addressing emergencies and carry out more full-scale renovations of our branches. Though we have been able to approach some of our buildings comprehensively and we have done noble work together to reduce our deferred maintenance, Brooklyn Public Library still faces $250 million in unmet needs. While there is no easy solution to our capital predicament, Providing a reliable, recurring source of funding for libraries in the 10-year capital plan is absolutely critical. I know I am preaching to the choir. We truly appreciate the Council's advocacy to include libraries in the 10-year capital plan, though the outcome was ultimately disappointing. Thank you for working with us to ensure that libraries are supported. Brooklyn Public Library is committed to helping meet our capital challenges through identifying creative projects and additional funding streams. Coupled with a long-term and sustained investment by the City of New York, we can build upon the progress we have made. I am heartened by your focus on library capital projects and your recognition that we must collectively rise to this challenge. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, Linda, as you know, I'm going into my 22nd year of these <laughs> hearings, first 11 as a uh, Queens Public Library staff person. I've listened to um, several different uh, directors or CEOs of the Brooklyn Public Library deliver testimony. Uh, 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 this is one of the most exciting BPL testimonies that I've ever seen in all of those years, I have to say. Um, there are a lot of really big and exciting projects underway in Brooklyn, and um, it makes me very proud that together we've worked to put a lot more money in the budget, right, in the Brooklyn delegation and yep. your elected officials, but uh, there's a lot of really, really good things in there, and the 10-year capital plan is absolutely critical. You know that we agree with that. Thank you. Who's next? Me. Iris. Good morning. My name is Iris Weintraub, and I am the Chief Operating Officer of the New York Public Library. I'd like to thank Speaker Corey Johnson, Committee Chair Jimmy Van Bramer, the committee members, and the entire City Council for holding this hearing. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and would like to thank the Council for your steadfast support of libraries. We are here today to discuss the capital projects in libraries our successes, our ongoing capital needs, and ways we're working with the city to improve the capital process. As you well know, the NYPL system is large and requires significant ongoing improvements to ensure that libraries are functional, safe spaces for our patrons. Our physical infrastructure is significant with 93 buildings and 62 current capital projects 
underway, including 25 in the Bronx, 30 in Manhattan, and seven on Staten Island. These current projects represent 484 million in total costs. With city, state, and private support, we've been able to significantly advance our capital program. We've worked hard to adapt our buildings to best meet the needs of our patrons, and we continue to improve and expand our physical footprint. Just a few examples. We recently celebrated the grand opening of our new Van Cortlandt branch in the Bronx. The new location is 5,800 square feet, more than double the size of the former branch, which was 2,700 square feet. A 685 square foot McCombs Bridge is our smallest branch. Located inside a New York City housing project called Harlem River House, the branch offers only 12 seats. A new McCombs Library is currently under construction at 3,300 square feet, which will be five times the size of the current library. It is scheduled to open in early 2020. Our Roosevelt Island Library is also moving to a new location and will increase its size from 3,400 square feet to 5,200 square feet. It is also expected to open in early 2020. We recently broke ground on a new Charleston library in Staten Island. The 10,000 square foot library with dedicated adult, teen, and children's areas is located in a shopping area that will make it easier for families to visit. We anticipate that the new Charleston Library will open in early 2021. Our biggest project is the Midtown Campus, which completes, includes a complete renovation of our largest circulating branch, the Starvos Niarcos Foundation Library, previously the Mid-Manhattan Library. The project is currently in construction and is scheduled to open in 2020 with brand new spaces for adults, teens, and children, a business center, and new programming educational spaces, just to name a few things. The Midtown Campus project also includes upgrades, increased public space, and more dedicated space for quiet research at the Stephen A. Schwartzman Building on 42nd Street and 5th Avenue. The project is currently in the second phase. Most recently, the nine-room Center for Research in the Humanities just opened on the second floor of the building, adding 56 seats exclusively dedicated to quiet study and work with our research collections. Lastly, as a result of our inclusion in the city's 10-year capital plan in fiscal year 16, we are in the midst of a complete renovation of five of our historic Carnegie libraries in high need neighborhoods. The libraries are Hunts Point and Melrose in the Bronx, Fort Washington and 125th Street in Manhattan, and Port Richmond in Staten Island. The city committed $100 million in capital funding towards these much needed renovations. Without allocated funding over 10 years, such major renovations would not be possible. Additionally, as information hubs and one of the city's key public com computing centers, NYPL continues to improve its technology infrastructure. We currently have approximately $18 million in system-wide technology projects that are either being implemented or planned. They include the replacement of desktop computers and printers, upgrades to our system-wide Wi-Fi, and improved access, access to our digital collections. Investing in technology allows us to br help bridge the digital divide for the estimated 2.4 million New York residents who don't have broadband internet access at home. For our capital projects, there is no doubt that we have benefited from the support of individual council members, borough presidents, the speaker, and the mayor. And we're grateful for all the support However, despite the progress we've made and the support we've received, the NYPL still faces nearly 412 million of cap new capital needs. This number comprises all of our possible projects, including full renovations of branches, state of good repair projects, such as ADA accessibility, HVAC, boilers, facades, and roofs, 
technology upgrades, and funding shortfalls on existing projects. Additionally, many branches need to be reconfigured for how New Yorkers use libraries today with increased programming, educational, and community space. At NYPL, the average age of our libraries is 70 years old, with many branches dating back more than 100 years, making the challenge of keeping our physical infrastructure in good condition even more acute. We understand that access starts at the front door of our libraries, and, our, and we are working to make our buildings fully accessible, with accessibility an integral part of the design of all of our new branches and full renovations. The capital work that we do is necessary to be able to provide the level of library services and the safe, accessible spaces that our staff and users deserve. Together, we've made great progress on the library's capital projects. The MYPL has significantly improved the capital commitment rate to 40% in fiscal year 19 and continues to work with the city to think creatively on how to make the process better. While we have had successes, we continue to face a number of challenges. Thanks to your support and advocacy, in fiscal year 2016, we were included in the city's 10-year capital plan for the first time and received $100 million, which allowed us to do full renovations of five branches. This was truly a game changer. However, we have not received any new funding under the 10-year process since then. We hope to remain part of the city's 10-year capital planning conversation and to build on the progress we have made. We continue to work with DDC to find ways to improve the management and delivery of library capital projects. We remain hopeful that DDC's front end, end planning process will lead to more consistent budgets and faster timelines for library projects. However, DDC project shortfalls remain a major concern. Nearly all of our DDC managed projects are coming back with significant funding shortfalls. Not only delay, this not only delays projects, but also impacts our entire cap, capital portfolio. As we're forced to allocate finite capital dollars to shortfalls as opposed to new needs. We are encouraged about the possibility of a design build authority from the state for DDC managed library projects. This important piece of legislation was recently approved by both houses and awaits the governor's approval. We're also working with Deputy Mayor Bean and her office to find innovative ways to advance our capital program. Construction of our five Carnegie libraries, as well as our new Charleston branch, is being managed by EDC. When appropriate, we're going to certain projects as when appropriate, we're doing certain projects as cultural pass-throughs, including the property purchase of the recently opened Van Cortland branch and the Midtown Campus project. However, increasing the number of co cultural grant projects is not financially sustainable, and therefore not something we're eager to do. We're also working with the city's Department of Housing, Preservation and Development and the Robin Hood Foundation to develop the Inwood Library. This innovative project features a mixed-use development that will house a brand new library, 100% affordable housing, a community center, a STEM center, and a universal pre-K site. Finally, we're working with the city to make purchase of public use laptops capitally eligible and are hopeful that the details will be worked out very soon. More major capital projects has also meant an increase in the number of branches that will be subject to long-term temporary closure. The temporary closures of a library means the loss of library services to a community, something that we take very seriously. We've developed a three-pronged approach to temporary services during branch closures, including partnering with local community organizations to secure temporary program space, regular bookmobile services, and enhanced services at near, nearby branches. <laughs> we appreciate how important temporary library services are to a community 
during extended closures, and we will do all that we can within our limited funding to creatively pro provide for these communities. For more than a century, NYPL's network of libraries across the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island have served as powerful engines of individual and community empowerment and development, but they require capital investment and an efficient city capital process to ensure that we can continue to provide all New Yorkers with the tools and with the essential public spaces that they need and they deserve. Whether it's a newly renovated Van Cortland or recent fully renovations at the Stapleton Library in Staten Island or the Washington Heights Library in Manhattan, the impact of improved facilities is clear. Circulation, program attendance, and visits grow significantly after capital investments. For example, the first full year after Washington Heights was renovated, the branch saw a 105% increase in program attendance and a 47% increase in visits and a 45% increase in circulation over the last full year. These are typical numbers that show the importance of offering New Yorkers inspiring, functional, modern spaces. Together, we have made great progress on our capital program, and we need to continue to build on that progress. We're grateful to the Council's longtime support of libraries and look forward to working with you in the future. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. I remain available to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Iris Weinshaw. Um, before we hear from uh, Dennis Walcott, I just want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilwoman Inez Barron from Brooklyn, and I know uh, in a few moments uh, she will speak uh, about her very important um, uh, resolution on ending the Cuban embargo, which we spoke about a little bit earlier uh, when Councilmember Rodriguez was here. But first we'll hear from uh, uh, President CEO of the Queens Public Library, uh, Dennis Walcott, before we go back to the uh, cultural portion of our hearing. Thank you, sir, and good morning to you, Chair. And I'm Dennis Walcott, the President and CEO of the Queens Public Library, and to Councilwoman Barron as well. Good morning to you. It's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, thank you, Chair Van Bramer and the members of the Distinguished Committee for the opportunity to testify. Uh, before I give my formal presentation, I just want to take a moment to thank you, Chair, for your leadership. It has truly been inspiring. It has allowed us to talk about our projects, which has taken place already and moving forward. And without you and the members of the Council and the Speaker and the Mayor's Office, but especially you, uh, this would not be possible. So I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Thanks to the investments made by elected officials over the many years, in particular, uh, the Chair, the members of the City Council, the de Blasio Administration, the Queensborough President's Office, we have capital improvements happening at many of our libraries across the Queens Public Library System. Every Queen City Council District has an active or planned capital project in place. The Department of Design and Construction, DDC, manages the Queen's Public Library projects. There are currently 42 projects, either active or in various stages of DDC's front end planning unit with a portfolio value totaling $255 million. Projects in this portfolio include, but are not limited to, uh, roof repair, uh, HVAC replacements, interior renovations, building expansions, and brand new libraries. Uh, in the chair's district, there will be a complete interior renovation of the Broadway Library, where DDC anticipates work beginning in autumn of 2020. We will also do complete interior renovation of the Woodside Library and are actively fundraising for this project as well. In Council Member Koswitz District, a brand new library will be built in Rigo Park. It has been something the community has wanted for a great deal of time, so I'm happy that that work is underway on that project. In Council Member Moyer's District, the Corona Library will undergo an expansion to accommodate the growing population and the ever-increasing number of programs we offer there. In District 19, a brand new library will be built for the Douglaston community. In District 20, a brand new elevator will be installed in Flushing Library, as well as an upgrade to the original elevator system. All this taking place while we cannot close down Flushing, so this is going to be one of our more complex projects. Uh, the Flushing Library is the busiest library branch, and so this project is essential to helping customers move more quickly and more efficiently 
efficiently uh, throughout the building. Similarly, in District 22, a new elevator will be installed in the Astoria Library as well as other upgrades to the building to make it more accessible to the public. In District 23, the Queens Village Library will undergo an interior renovation with work also being done to replace the roof and upgrade the HVA system. In District 24, the Briarwood Library will be expanded and renovated. Similarly, in District 25, the Jackson Heights Library will be expanded and renovated as well. In Districts 27 and District 28, the South Hollis Library and the Baisley Park Library, respectively, will undergo complete interior renovations. The Middle Village Library in District 30 will close next month uh, in November 2019, or really soon, this is, is November tomorrow, matter of fact, in order for the HVA system to be replaced. In District 31, the Far Rockaway community will receive a beautiful state-of-the-art brand new library designed by the world-renowned architectural firm Snowheader. Finally, in District 32, the Woodhaven Library will receive an exterior and interior renovation Will make, which will make it more accessible to the public and will restore original masonry openings to reinvigorate one of our original Carnegie libraries. While there are a great deal of exciting projects either planned or taking place, we are still faced with significant challenges, as my colleagues have said as well. Uh, the biggest challenge we face is as a system in the amount of shortfalls on our project. As many of you are well aware and painfully aware, as soon as a shortfall is identified on a project, the process stops immediately. If presented with a shortfall on a project in September, for example, chances are we would not be able to recommence that project until the next fiscal year, when hopefully the city would have provided new funding to help cover the funding gap. For seven priority projects of ours alone, we are experiencing a funding gap of over $40 million. The highly inefficient process adds to the project delays and costs that deprives the communities of their libraries. Therefore, one of the most important things the city can do to help libraries is the capital process is to create a dedicated pool of capital funds strictly for the use of libraries to address mid-fiscal year shortfalls. Next, if QPL, Queens Public Library, is forced to fundraise for its capital plan in a peaceful manner, uh, relying on individual council members to fund multi-million dollar projects, as the council members know, our buildings will rapidly fall out of the state of good repair. Therefore, New York City's three library systems must receive another significant lump sum allocation similar to fiscal year 2016 $300 million allocation to libraries under the city's 10-year capital plan. This funding is vital for libraries to plan effectively and to initiate much needed critical infrastructure renovation and expansion projects. Additionally, as DDC implements their comprehensive plan to improve the delivery of capital projects, it is unknown what the impact will be with regard to the increased fees and costs that could be passed on to libraries. As it is implemented, the three library systems will certainly keep the council apprised of any issues that may arise. Creating a dedicated pool of capital funding to cover shortfalls on library projects and adequately funding the three systems in the 10-year capital plan are the most important things that can be done now. As always, thank you for your leadership and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis Walcott. So uh, the number one thing that all of you identified is the issue with the 10-year capital plan, and uh, obviously we'll talk about DDC a little bit as well, but uh, the 10-year capital plan infusion was a great success, maybe one of our greatest successes actually, which allows for so much of what's in your testimony. In fact, I think the, the new lots uh, branch, which Councilmember Barron represents and took me to a few years ago, I know is getting uh, that $20 million upgrade as part of the 10-year uh, capital plan infusion that we got a few years ago, no? That's correct, and we're uh, in the midst of um, a serious outreach and engagement in the community, uh, as well as looking at architects for that project. Right, so let me just say, on the part of the administration, it's a complete uh, a failure to not have uh, re-upped that uh, funding in the 10-year capital plan for libraries. Absolute uh, disgrace in my mind, because there's so much good in this testimony, so much good. Uh, it is so different than the, the testimony that you've given in years past, and I have been there for all of it. And, and it's because we did the right thing, but you can't just do the right thing once. 
and then say it's done and over with, mission accomplished, right? The mission is not accomplished. And these are large systems. It's like painting a big house. When you get to one end, you've got to start again at the beginning. And keeping the deferred maintenance under control is a relentless process that we can never take our, you know, we can never take our eye off of it because otherwise, you know, we risk um, emergency closings. And the thing that all of us are deeply committed to is making sure that we're consistent in the offering offering of services that we provide. That when we say we're going to be there until nine o'clock at night, we are in fact open until nine o'clock at night. Let me quickly ask all three systems, and Iris is going to speak about your conversations with the administration about being included once again in a meaningful way in the 10-year capital plan. So before I talk yep. to that, another reason why being in the 10-year capital plan makes so much sense is because you have rational planning. Yeah. You're able to pick out projects and do a top-to-bottom renovation. Um, and you know consistently that the money will be there as the project moves forward. Um, Brooklyn identified their projects that they used with their $100 million. We identified five Carnegies in neighborhoods of need, of high need, um, and it's allowing us to do this rational top to bottom. We're not just doing an ADA project or a boiler or HVAC. It's being done in a total fashion. Um, as for conversations with the administration, um, sure, I mean, they're, they're ongoing. Uh, we always uh, make the pitch and, and hope that we would get um, included. We're not saying no to the lump sums because I think as my colleagues pointed out, the lump sums do help us um, deal with those emergencies and deal with those smaller projects. But nonetheless, um, we believe the conversation will continue regarding inclusion in the 10-year plan. Dennis, is your mic on? We've been able, I didn't know Linda turned it off, so, so my apologies. Uh, we've been able to raise the importance of what capital actually means. And I think that's something extremely important because we don't always talk about circulation, we always talk about programs. But if you don't have a solid building, if you can't plan as Iris indicated, then the circs and everything else is not possible. And I think as a result of having a dedicated pool of dollars, but also being included in a plan to allow us to plan properly, that gives the structure and the organization the opportunity to do it the right way. But we, we uh, all have to redouble our efforts to make sure that this happens uh, because uh, uh, new lots doesn't happen without this, and for every uh, uh, new lots, there are dozens of other uh, libraries in the city of New York that also uh, could be done if we do this the right way. I'd like to, like to add um, that new lots is kind of the perfect example where we had money from the 10-year plan and then a significant um, grant from uh, council member uh, Barron, the largest one uh, that the library has ever received a $6 million um, uh, allocation, which means that we'll really be able to do something significant on that site. Well, as uh, demonstrated, when you have the political leadership and the political will to get it done, as uh, Councilmember Barron and I were out there several years ago, uh, she was adamant that this get done, and it got done. So if uh, the mayor believes in, in making sure this happens, uh, it, it can be done and will be done. Let me just go over to DDC uh, briefly. All of you mentioned DDC as well. Uh, have you seen any improvement in the operations of DDC and your interactions with DDC and these capital projects that all of you have ongoing uh, since uh, there have been changes made both uh, in the personnel and, and the hierarchy and obviously I have great respect for Lorraine Grillo. Um, but also in some of the, the processes that they've also changed. So uh, I think Lorraine is a very dear and good friend of all of us um, here testifying. Um, she is trying very hard, um, but what she has walked into is not a perfect process. Um, uh, she has uh, identified you know, new personnel and are moving personnel around uh, to accommodate the needs of the large portfolio of the libraries. Um, 
they initiated uh, front-end planning, which I know we've all uh, contributed projects to. It's not a perfect system because that system has now identified projects that have huge funding gaps. And a big reason why they have huge funding gaps is because they've sat on the shelf so long. And so as time goes on, projects don't get less expensive, they get more expensive. Having said that, um, we uh, entered into 11 projects in front end planning. Three are now moving along. Would I like all 11 to move along? Yes, but having said that, three have moved along and um, I'm hopeful that as the front end planning uh, gets started with newer projects, but not older projects that have aged on the shelf, that we'll see the success that we need. Um, the second thing is that DDC and Lorraine were very um, forceful about getting design build uh, when it comes to DDC projects, and libraries would be among that uh, category. Um, as we all know, design build does have some uh, challenges, but those projects tend to move more quickly, um, and uh, you can sometimes get it at a cheaper rate. So uh, those particulars are being worked out. I don't think projects have yet been identified. I think the only projects that have been identified for design build are the five new prisons that are gonna be built. Um, and beyond that, we haven't heard whether any of the library projects um, are included. So in, in summation, let me just say that um, uh, DDC is trying. Uh, we're not getting the same message that I think many of us got over the last five years. This is the way it's done, can't be changed. Um, and we're hopeful that, you know, moving along that uh, they will uh, get more and more successes with these innovations and maybe accept some other innovations as well. Um, just uh, to briefly add, um, I think that the word here is hopeful. It's recent, the changes there. We are, um, we're pleased with the changes below, at Lorraine's level, um, below, below Lorraine's level. We think that um, there's a new energy and sense of commitment and so we're open to, uh, we're open to what's coming down the pike. So. She turned it off again before she slid it over, so. <laughs> so I agree with what Linda and Iris just said as far as the relationship with DDC. I think our relationship with DDC has definitely improved. And we had a somewhat solid, not that we always agreed, relationship with DDC, but I think at the levels of Lorraine, but also her deputies, we've had ongoing meetings. Our meetings now are every other week with them at various levels of communication. Um, I think there may be some unattended consequences that we have to watch, which I alluded to in my testimony as far as some of the changes. And again, I think with the front end planning unit, it helps tremendously. And I think as a result of their de attention to detail as far as the cost factors, therefore that's where the shortfalls come from. So we have to be very conscious of that and watch that, I think, extremely carefully because that has a major impact on all of our projects. But from a communication point of view, uh, from a laying out a vision point of view, uh, from the new energy that my colleague talked about as far as the personnel that are assigned to work with us, I've seen tremendous improvement there, but at the same time, I think we still have a long way to go. Well, it's, it's good to hear that you believe there's progress and, and, and hope, but I think uh, the system uh, is still broken in many ways uh, because as long as we have these kinds of delays and uh, cost overruns and issues uh, with getting projects built on time, uh, it is uh, interesting to note that the, the, the new jails are in design, build, but not new libraries, um, which uh, is a problem for me. Um, uh, I, I want to um, uh, make sure we switch back um, and, and allow uh, Councilmember Barron, but I uh, uh, can't let you go, uh, uh, Dennis Walcott, without yes addressing a recent issue, obviously. Um, the uh, leak at the new Hunters Point <laughs> Library, is that a, a failure on the part of DDC to build uh, a library that won't leak, or what happened there? So let's set the record straight, and thank you for the question. The leak 
that was being referred to in the headlines in one of our uh, tabloids was really a sprinkler system uh, head that was loose that had some water uh, come as a result of that and then also the flashing at the door at the terrace and so that's being readjusted as well. The sprinkler head has been replaced and that was the leak itself. So it's the normal uh, process of a new building and the new building having some challenges but not an issue with DDC as far as the build. It's just a leak that was there between the sprinkler head and the flashing. And the flashing was as a result of the driving rain one of the particular days and it was blowing in that direction. So either it's been done or being done, but definitely the sprinkler head has been replaced. Okay, uh, but uh, you are happy with the uh, construction and you believe you were presented with a building that is functional and works and uh, so you don't think that the, the sprinkler breaking was an issue of quality uh, build? No, it's just but as other articles have indicated, I mean, we have some challenges and we're working with DDC and the architect and other agencies as far as how we respond to those challenges. Uh, and one of those challenges we responded to right away in the moving of books away, even though we had a building department approval uh, back in 2014 as far as, as far as accessibility is concerned in other parts of the building, but we were sensitive to the issues that people were raising, so we addressed that. And we're working with DDC to see if there are other ways along with the architect that we can respond to some of the concerns. I think one of the articles also pointed out about uh, noise level. I'm not sure about my colleagues and their quiet rooms, but I mean, our quiet rooms are not necessarily ac acoustically designed with uh, absorption uh, material is basically people inside the quiet room should be quiet. And so there's some challenges with that as well as far as the design and as you all know very well know, uh, the atrium set up and some of the noise that may be created with having that type of open space. And so we're constantly addressing functionality because you know I've divided it into three buckets in my head, uh, aesthetics, uh, compliance, and functionality. And we're making sure we focus on the functionality of the building and making sure the building is serving the needs of the customers. So, for example, uh, to date, you'd be pleased to know we've had 35,000 people in just about a month that have come through our doors at Hunter's Point. Uh, and that number is just growing. So Hunter's Point has already jumped, it jumped into the top 10 category of all of our libraries, in Queens at least. And so we're pleased by that. And then, like I would imagine my colleagues with their systems, we're always as assessing what I call the biorhythms of a library in a neighborhood. So we've seen some unique biorhythms as far as the computer center, for example. <laughs> in our cyber center, two-thirds of the computers have not been even turned on, uh, which is an interesting factoid in that it shows the type of community that's there, they're bringing their own laptops in and they're turning on their laptops. So we're gonna take a look at the numbers over another couple of weeks and then make some adjustments as far as the use of the space where the cyber center is located. And even with the one third of the computers that have been turned on, and I'm talking about from the beginning of the library opening, even with those computers, they're not going throughout the entire day. It's only for a small part of the day. So we're gonna reimagine that and see what we can do. And then in the children's area, we're taking a look at that as far as functionality and how we address you know, some of the challenges there. So I think that with DDC, you know, they built the building. And as you well know, the building's been in the planning process for close to 19 years. And so we're addressing that now that it's open and making sure that DDC uh, is a part of that since they are the builders of the library. Right. And just two, uh, uh, two last questions uh, to clear up, because I know there's been some uh, uh, political uh, uh, grandstanding uh, outside the library. Um, the building is, is built to code and, and is ADA compliant, no? It, it's built to code and ADA compliant, even though there are agencies looking at it. And so we're working with the agencies to make sure that it's in total compliance. And just as you well know, but just to put it out there, that the areas that people are questioning, and this is not from a political perspective, just in general, uh, are tiers, they're not floors. And so the floors 
are accessible and the tiers are within the floor. So I've been to a number of places where you have tiers uh, that don't necessarily require the accessibility per se because the floors, whether below or top, make the particular agency building in compliance. But again, we're working with um, the Department of Design and Construction, the architects and other agencies to make sure that we address it in a way that satisfies all people who have raised concern for, from the political point of view, I stay above the politics, I'm not involved in that. I'm dealing with the functionality of a library and making sure that we're in compliance with everyone who uh, comes through the door. Which is 35,000 people in a very short period of time. So uh, people vote with their feet. Um, and I certainly have had lots of folks uh, tell me how incredible they feel the library is and what a great addition it is. Uh, to the community and uh, the kinks uh, will be worked out but at the end of the day uh, for generations uh, uh, hundreds of thousands if not millions of people will ultimately use and benefit well, from. you got to even go above hundreds of thousands because already as you said and I said we're at 35,000 and that's just a month yeah and so we expect some really robust numbers at Hunter's Point and the community has been waiting and I, I want to at least for me at least wrap up on this point around Hunter's Point, the, fan the staff are fantastic. I mean, the staff are there, the children's librarians are there. They've had to, for example, increase the number of children librarian sessions as a result of the demand there, and they found a way to increase the number of sessions. And so our manager and our staff there are currently and always responding to the needs of the community on how we can adjust. In addition to that, as you know, we're about to launch our environmental center uh, at Hunters Point as well, which will expand our ability to work around environmental issues and specifically targeting not just that community but other libraries. And so that's the balancing act as far as the implementing of programs while at the same time balancing the capital needs and the challenges of a building that's a brand new building. Thank you uh, all very much. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming uh, for all, oh, yes, uh, but before that, uh, Council Member Barron has a library related question. I was rushing to get to Cuba, but um, if I could get to Cuba. Um, oh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but first we'll have a, a library question. Thank you so much to the chair and thank you to the panel for coming and presenting your testimony. And I do want to acknowledge the fact that when we first came into the council, you came and you visited the New Lots Library and saw the state and we did have the president come as well. And it's been a long time coming, but we're finally going to see uh, a brand new library at New Lots and I'm excited about it. And yes, I did put a significant amount of money into this six million dollars because I believe that libraries are in fact one of the equalizing forces that we can use to make sure that all of the people who are living in our great city have equity in terms of literature and media and technology and language and job development opportunities and a collaboration with the community and I think that that's really what we're, we're beginning to see more and more of, that these libraries are collaborating with the communities that exist. We're excited. We had an expansive number of people who came to the planning session. I don't know if you got the report. It was more than what they had planned for, but that's a good thing. There will be more community input talking about what they want to see in the new library and as we move forward with the plan to have a, a building that reflects the rich history of the site on which that library is located. Uh, that square block is designated as African Burial Ground Square because it was the site of a cemetery which at one point had the remains of whites in one section and the remains of blacks in another section. And when the Dutch Reformed Church built their new building and established a cemetery, they took the remains of the whites and reinterred them at the Dutch Reform Church across the street, and according to the Brooklyn Eagle of the time, left the bones of the blacks bleaching on the side of the road. So there was great desecration that was perpetrated at that time, and we have since moved forward to make sure that uh, as the park, which is adjacent to the library, is redesigned and has been renamed as Sankofa Park, which Sankofa is a word which means you can go back 
and reclaim your history and use that to move yourself forward into the future. So we're excited about the library coming. We're excited about the involvement of the community and designing the library and all of the resources that it will offer. And I wanted to thank you and thank you for the chair for making sure that that happened. Um, and then, shall I? Okay. Cheers first. Uh, so thank with you. that, I want to thank our three uh, uh, library uh, executives for being here. Um, and uh, we will continue to work to make sure you're in the 10-year capital plan and get things right with DDC. Uh, so the three of you are excused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, and I know so many in the audience are here uh, to speak to uh, the very important resolution number 1092 that Council Member Barron has introduced. Uh, I am proud to be a co prime sponsor along with Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. Uh, and Councilmember Barron's resolution calls upon the President uh, to lift the Cuban embargo and end the Cuban travel ban uh, once and for all. And I would ask those who are uh, leaving to uh, depart as quietly as you can so that we can afford Councilmember Barron her opportunity uh, to speak uh, to the resolution. And then we are going to call uh, a panel to speak to the resolution before we go to DDC. We're going back and forth here uh, because we have so much on the agenda today at the committee. But uh, with that, I want to thank Councilmember Barron for her leadership uh, and ask her to say a few words on resolution 1092. Thank you to the chair and also want to thank you for accommodating the schedule of the presentation so that I could be a part of this. Uh, 1092, as has been stated, calls for lifting the embargo and for ending the travel ban on Cuba. And we know that uh, this ban has been in place for more than 50 years and as we look at the conditions which led to the ban being first imposed, those situations and those circumstances have changed. So I want to thank the chair as well as Council Member Rodriguez for being co-prime sponsors of this bill and bringing it forward at this time. You know, the, the, New York is the site of international affairs. The UN is located here and all of that business is conducted here and we feel that this is an important time for us to make sure that we make a statement. The present administration in Washington is seeking to create a climate that has many people fearful, fearful of their own status as uh, immigrants here and how they might in fact be prosecuted and persecuted in terms of that. So we're looking to make sure that those gains towards normalizing, which had been established during the Obama administration, are maintained and that we don't go back, that we don't revert to those times uh, when we had the Cold War, when those uh, sanctions were in place. So we're asking that the president, in fact, lift the embargo and, and the travel ban. We know that it's very harmful to the residents of Puerto Rico, as well as those people who are living here, residents of Cuba, I'm sorry, as well as those people who are living here who have relatives there who want to travel and make sure that they can have that opportunity to visit. It also is impacting the economy because cruise ships are being banned from docking in Cuba. And so we're calling for an end of that. It's impacting also a collaboration between the medical research that was being conducted between Cuba and the United States, particularly looking at how to end lung disease. Uh, I want to again thank my colleagues for co-sponsoring this bill, and I want to acknowledge those persons who were involved in drafting it. That's Christy D Dwyer, the attorney who drafted the legislation, Councilmember Rodriguez's office, Legislative Director Evelyn Collado, your office, uh, Jack ben Bentanovich, and my office, Joyce Simmons, my chief of staff, and the legislative director, M. Indigo Washington. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, I too believe that uh, this embargo hurts people uh, and uh, eliminates what we should be doing, which is uh, collaborating, sharing, and uh, there is so much culture, history, uh, health at stake, um, and this president is wrong on virtually everything. Um, and uh, this is one of those many things. So I know that a number of folks have uh, signed up to testify on the resolution. I'm going to call groups up in four. Uh, we're going to have a, a strict time limit um, of about two minutes per person. If you could uh, uh, summarize your testimony or meet the two-minute deadline, that would be appreciated because we have a number of folks who want to speak to this very important resolution. And we also do have DDC in the building as well. Uh, so James Haskins, is James Haskins still here? He had to leave, okay. Do you want to read his testimony? Did you also sign up? What's your name? Nope, there you are. Okay, so why don't you come up? Uh, Shepard McDaniel? Yes. Great. Uh, and... Uh, you can also represent James. Is Ann Mitchell still with us? Ann, would you come forward? Uh, Brody Enoch, is Brody Enoch? Please come forward. And Gilberto Vija, please come forward. <laughs> Thank you. We'll let everyone get seated and we'll start from my left, your right, with Mr. Vija. Would you like to begin your testimony? Me? Yes. Yes. Uh, pull the microphone close to you. Make sure the red light is on. It's on. Yeah. My testimony, Mike, is my name is Gilberto Villa, a native of Havana, Cuba. I'm resident, current resident of the city of New York. I will be brief and to the point because other colleagues will also depose on this matter. Today, I appear before this honorable legislative body to ask you to approve proposal number 1092, a call on the president to lift the embargo and restriction on travel to Cuba. The embargo and the restriction on trips to my homeland, Cuba, accrued a criminal measure against the welfare of our people. As a Cuban born and raised in Cuba, I have eyewitnessed the dire consequence of this criminal measure. The monetary economy losses are immense. The Cuban government has estimated that the total and I think it's wrong because he has said one, 116, 800 million, and I think it's on the billions. In the 59 years of blockade, the area of head, head had been severely affected by the back of medicine intended to the treatment of cancer and other diseases, long and short term. There are many reasons why it's necessary to revoke the blockade of my homeland, Cuba. It is our desire that this honorable body approve of request on behalf of the Cuban people, my family, and my own. I give my sincere thanks for the opportunity to discuss this vital issue here. Thank you. And by the way, I'm living in, this co in New York 60 years already. Thank you. The chair had to step away, and in his absence, I will continue. The next panelist, please present your testimony. All right, I can't see the mic. They're going to have could you pass oh, no, the no, mic? No, no, no. Sergeant at arms, could you assist him, please? No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. All right, cool. very cool. Um, good morning. My name is Brody Enoch. I am here representing IFCO Pastors for Peace. 
uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a graduate student at Fordham University, and part of this graduate program, and I know I'm old and I can't see and don't really like people, don't even know why I'm doing an MSW, but I'm doing it anyway. So I was, I, I was fortunate enough to land at IFCO Passes for Peace, and it's where I came in touch with this amazing resolution. So being new to this, I, I had to actually take a step back. I'm, you're going to hear from people such as the, as the young man who just spoke about his ties to his homeland and the need for him to have uh, remain connected to his family and his, and his people. You're going to hear from people who are far more learned than I am about, who have been doing this for a lot longer than I have, about, about the Cuban experience in the African diaspora. You're going to hear from folks like that. But I had to sit back for a second and say, why do, why, why, why do we even need to be here? I mean, if, if we have this Cuban blockade and we have this continued uh, uh, antagonism towards Cuba, we, it must be because they have some uh, uh, amazingly anti-American political stance, and that's the reason why we should not have any doings with them. Well, if that's the case, we should really not have any uh, uh, connection to half the planet, half the countries on this planet. So then I said to myself, well, maybe, just maybe, they were involved in fixing the past election, and that's why we would have no con you know, connection with them. And I said, wait a minute, that's, that would be in their favor, because obviously this administration loves countries who do that. And, 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 and then it hit me, the hypocrisy of all of this, that if I were lucky enough to go to Cuba, that I couldn't stay in a hotel, I would have to stay in someone's home, yet the person who occupies 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is able to build a hotel down the block from, from where he's staying, and all of the dignitaries from around the world, including, including Cuba, can come stay in his hotel, but I can't go to Cuba to stay. So there's really only one reason I can come up with why this has been going on and why it continues to go on. It's because Cuba had the audacity to be an island full of brown people who decided a long time ago that they themselves would decide what political system they would lead and how they would rule their island. And of course, they couldn't do that, not in this great um, world we live in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, you got one? Oh, good afternoon. Oh. Yes. My name is Ann Mitchell, and I'm a member of New York, New Jersey, Cuba C, a broad coalition of organizations and individuals who for decades have worked for normalization of the relationship between the United States and Cuba. I am here this morning to present a summary of the testimony of Joan P. Gibbs and Rosemary Mealy, which was submitted electronically. <clears throat> First imposed during the Eisenhower administration, the Cuban embargo is a relic of the Cold War and should have ended with it. The embargo is a failed policy. It has not caused the Cuban people to re rebel in 60 years, despite the overwhelming hardships that it has caused as the majority of the Cuban people continue to support the Cuban transition to new forms of economic and social transformation. Cuba is a sovereign nation, and it should be respected as such by the United States. The Cuban embargo has long been opposed by a majority of the nations of the world. During the most recent vote in a, on a resolution condemning the embargo in the U UN General Assembly, 189 of the 193 members of that body voted in favor of the resolution. Two countries, the United States and Israel, voted against the resolution. The embargo is also reportedly opposed by a majority of the citizens of the United States. In November 2014, Obama and then Cuban President Raul Castro announced that the two governments would restore full diplomatic ties and ease the more than 50 years of bilateral hostilities. The same day, Obama and Castro also announced uh, We have your written testimony in front of us. Uh, is there a way for you to uh, summarize? Yes. In Thank conclusion, you. I urge 
you to vote in favor of the resolution uh, 1092 and to present the resolution to full city council for a vote. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Today. Thank you very much. That is certainly my intention on both fronts. <laughs> Last but not least on this panel. I am confident that this committee would agree that sports and culture are two fundamental keys to the mutual understanding and friendship between all peoples of the world. Last night, millions of us watched Game 7 of the 2019 World Series. Throughout my youth, teenage, and young adult life, I played New York City Sandlot, semi-pro, and varsity baseball in both high school and college. And I continue to coach both Little League and Senior League baseball today. The historic agreement between Cuba and Major League Baseball to allow Cuban baseball players to finally play in the United States was primarily overturned by the reinstituted embargo because the Trump administration did not want to pay Cuban, want Cuban ball players to be paid. And newer restrictions were just implemented against the Cuban mission to the United Nations, which prohibits their diplomatic staff from even attending New York Yankee and New York Met games because they are not allowed to travel anywhere in, the, in New York City except for the island of Manhattan. There are no baseball teams on the island of Manhattan anymore. This is from James Haskins. <laughs> Tomorrow is the start of November's Hip Hop Culture Month and the 45th anniversary of its 1974 beginnings right here in New York City. Since that time, hip hop culture has spread globally to every continent on earth, which includes the nation of Cuba. The 2020 International Hip Hop for Humanity Tour is scheduled to kick off in Cuba next spring, and its primary goal of New York City and Cuban hip hop artists being able to travel and then perform together, both in this city and in Cuba, is severely threatened by this embargo. I encourage the City Council to pass Resolution 1092 to end the embargo and lift all travel restrictions against Cuba. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you to this panel. Would you like to say, okay, we're going to thank you all for your testimony and for being here today and for your passionate advocacy. Uh, we are going back and forth, uh, and I want to um, ask uh, Commissioner Foley to come forward. We're going to very quickly uh, have uh, some uh, quick testimony from the Department of Design and Construction, uh, and then go back to testimony uh, from the community on the Cuba uh, embargo resolution. Thank you, Councilwoman. Mr. Foley, you have to be sworn in, right? Yes. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Von Bremer, members of the committee. I am Thomas Foley, Deputy Commissioner for Public Buildings for the Department of Design and Construction. Joining me at the table today is Phil Heller, our new Executive Director for the Libraries. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in our library's capital portfolio and on the improvements we are making to our library's unit under the direction of Commissioner Lorraine Grillo. DDC works with all three of the library systems that we hear earlier today. Currently have over 153 active library projects in our portfolio, valued at over half a billion dollars. A significant number of those projects are only now entering the schematic uh, design phase, which is an indicator that the number of projects in construction is destined to expand in the near future. DDC is proud of its role in shaping the next generation of libraries for all of New Yorkers. From the hugely popular downtown Flushing Library to New York Public Library's new Roosevelt Island branch, which is nearing completion, to the ongoing renovation East Flatbush branch for Brooklyn Public Library, to the innovative design of Hamilton Fish Library, which received an award from the Public Design Commission last year. We recognize the urgency of delivering library projects as quickly and as efficiently as possible while working within the strict legal, 
low bid framework that governs the use of our taxpayer funds. In January, we launched DDC's Strategic Blueprint for Construction Excellence, a 360 degree review of DDC's business practices and external challenges. One of the most important improvements is the addition of tools that the Public, the Bil Public Buildings Division can use to assist agencies with early capital planning before these projects come to DDC. This is a comprehensive program and it is important that I share key details with you today. First, as we reported to Council Member Gibson at the Capital Budget Subcommittee hearing last month, every single project that comes to DDC is now carefully reviewed by our front end planning unit before it officially comes to DDC. Front end planning was established in 2016 to ensure that every project a sponsor agency proposes has a reasonable scope and enough uh, money to pay for it. Front end planning gives our sponsor agencies a realistic assessment of budget and schedule so that they can, they can better plan their capital program. In fiscal year 19, 31 projects went through our F front end planning process. Nine were recommended, 20 were returned to the sponsors for more planning, and two are with us now. We are implementing many other initiatives under the blueprint to tackle the critical early planning phases. We are creating a better cost estimating program. Reliable cost estimating is essential to creating realistic budgets and is a critical part of our other improvement efforts. We're employing more DDC-led capital project scope developments, which are, better, or which are known as CPSD, these studies are expense funded and give sponsors more detail when developing the projects DDC will likely design and deliver. We are also establishing an advanced capital planning unit, which will include in-house staff dedicated to working with our sponsor agencies to look at their assets and make informed decisions about their short and long-term capital needs. We are also initiating building condition surveys that allow us to work with our sponsor agencies to better track the conditions of their assets and better plan the future capital needs and budgets. To that end, we began surveys with Brooklyn Public Library. We evaluated five of its branch libraries from top to bottom for factors such as code compliance, building defects, and reported back to BPL the scope of the work and the dollar amount it would take to bring each of these facilities into a state of good repair. We are investigating ways to fund and expand this effort to other sponsor agencies and look forward to sharing additional information on this effort in the near future. On the project delivery side, we have reduced changed order review time by 50% by centralizing the review process. The median number of days required for DDC to procure design and construction services has been cut in a third within, uh, since fiscal year 17. We have established standard design and construction durations that will set clear expectations for future performance. The designers that are working with us now must be on the clock when they start the design process. A clear example of this new standard is Rego Park Library. The design began in April of this year, will be completed in early 2021, and shovels will be in the ground that fall. We receive funding for additional construction manager services to provide on-site oversight and coordination and to keep our contract and, and to ensure our contractors keep to the schedules. We are also retooling vendor performance evaluations so we can improve performance. We continue to implement these changes highlighted in the blueprint every day, and we thank the council for its support and for considering legislation action that would improve the capital program system. One of the most important of these is the permission from Albany to use design build, which has a proven track record to reduce cost and project duration. It is a key proponent of our DDC's blueprint. We thank, we thank the council for its letter to support, in support of this to the governor. Finally, I'm pleased to announce at the direction of Commissioner Grillo, DDC has created a new position of ADA compliance um, that reports to my office. Mr. J. J. Wood came on board in July and provides expert uh, advice in the agency's approach to accessibility and reviews all of our projects for compliance and to ensure they satisfy city and federal accessibility requirements. 
DDC's capital program for the three library systems will continue to be very active while we institute comprehensive reforms across the entire capital construction process. We are proud of our past successes and we are adapting to the challenges to ensure continual improvements. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and I apologize for the delay. Obviously, we had uh, a, an unanticipated situation with Commissioner Finkelpearl this morning that I wanted to be very sensitive to, um, and then we are um, also wanting to be respectful of Councilmember Barron's very important resolution on the Cuban embargo, um, but very much respect your time and uh, being here today. Uh, so. A couple of things, so the new position in terms of uh, oversight of the libraries is very exciting. Um, can either of you talk a little bit about what that means and entails and how having a point person in, uh, in charge of all the library construction will hopefully help make this go a lot better? Yes, yeah, so we're very excited. Um, as I indicated, he came on board in July, reporting directly to my office. Uh, Jason Wood is uh, is a director of accessibility. He is then he's already immersed in uh, the various designs that are um, that are in the process now. He's also working directly with the libraries programs for projects in construction to ensure compliance. Um, we're very excited for this uh, recent addition. So I, I understand the director of ADA compliance, but is there not a point person on, on library, the library program? Oh yes, of course, uh, I'm sorry. Mr. Phil, uh, Phil Heller um, is our executive director for the library's program. Right, and, and uh, that was my question. I don't know if Mr. Heller uh, uh, can speak to how we envision this office uh, changing for the better the experiences that we've had with far too many libraries. Yes, so um, one of the important things that, as uh, Commissioner Foley uh, discussed is uh, important planning at the beginning stages. Um, so as the, the, the unit that actually delivers the projects, we wanna make sure that we have important information at the beginning, so essentially aligning scope and budget. All of the efforts that Commissioner Foley has talked about really point to that. Um, so we really look to it as um, giving us the tools to be able to actually deliver the projects. So, uh, as part of that, I have a staff of 50 people addre um, uh, addressing libraries. That's split uh, between the three library systems. We have about 15 for Brooklyn Public Library and then 17 each for Queens and New York Public Library. Uh, we actually, th this position allows the, the ability to sort of shift personnel as needed. Um, for right now, we have a lot of projects in, for New York Public Library that are in construction, so we're heavier on there. Um, as others shift to heavier construction, we're able to move those over. So that's where I have the oversight of that, is to be able to see where to, where to put the personnel as needed. Um, and really to institute uh, standards um, across the board uh, for all the library systems um, and make sure everybody's working together um, uh, collaboratively. So you have 50 people just in the library unit? Correct, yes. Uh, and you report to Commissioner Foley, uh, who, and you obviously work directly with uh, Lorraine. That's correct. correct. Rillo, right. Um, and uh, Iris Weintraub uh, spoke a little earlier about uh, the 11 projects that uh, they had worked with you on and that three were moving mm -hmm. forward. And uh, she was happy that three were moving forward but wanted uh, all of them to move forward. What happened there? Maybe you can walk us through that. Why only three out of 11 move forward? What does that look like and mean? So in essence, 11 projects come from, um, from New York Public Library. We go out, we'll do a site investigation from our front end planning team, basically a SWAT team of engineers and architects to go out and evaluate that site um, for whatever the particular scope of the project is. Um, we then do a full review over the course of th two to three months um, for uh, an in-depth review of what the programming needs are, what the scope of the project is, whether it's HVAC boiler, um, but also looking at other things such as um, uh, making sure fire alarm, every, everything else that could be impacted by that particular scope of work is included in that, in that particular, is included in that budget. Some of the challenges that we've had as an agency over the course of, of numerous years has been that we would accept the project from our sponsor 
um, only to find out that additional uh, scope needed to be added and additional monies would be necessary from the council. This is a way of addressing all these things up front before the project is initiated, before we hire a designer. We collectively all need to be on the same team um, and understand what the needs are for that particular project. And once we are, and we know that the funding is available with our colleagues at OMB and at the libraries unit, then we proceed and we hire the designer for that particular scope of work. And then they, and then I'm sorry, then they full, then, then the designer will proceed um, with reduced design durations that we've recently incorporated. Are, are 50 people enough? Do you need more? You can always use more. <laughs> well, uh, uh, we're, we're very, you know, as far as, as, as Phil had said, so he's coming on board, uh, extensive experience, a capital program in the police unit, so uh, within the police department, um, a great addition to DDC, and he has the ability, right, to re reporting directly to me and, and is able to um, fluctuate staff or to, you know, has that flexibility of moving staff out. You heard earlier from um, Ms. Johnson as far as the number of projects that are coming up in Brooklyn, um, and that way we could use that, those 50 with, within that as well. We have attrition naturally, so we're always hiring engineers, architects, planners, um, so we have a very robust team now. Um, in terms of uh, general contractors that don't perform, um, obviously we just came out of an experience where a poorly performing general contractor uh, added to uh, some of the pain that we all felt. And we had discussed over the years the issues with uh, a default and, and, and whatnot. Uh, what more are you doing to make sure that that experience isn't replicated and that we don't get stuck in these situations where uh, defaulting a uh, contractor delays a project even forward and so we're sort of stuck inconveniently with someone who we really would love to uh, terminate our relationship with, but doing so is even more problematic than sticking with them. So there's a number of things that, uh, that we're doing right now under the direction of uh, Commissioner Grillo. Uh, we really formed the basis of the strategic blueprint, which is really evaluating the contractors early on board consistently throughout, having the support of the commissioner's office that if, that if issues arise early in the process, that we certainly meet and engage with the bonding company and we, we pursue other avenues. Um, there are certainly challenges in the low bid process. Um, and one of the real benefits of design build would be to have the designer and the builder engaged uh, early on in the process. Um, and just to expand on you know, one, uh, an item that um, Ms. Weinshall had, had specified earlier as far as design build. So the city does have authorization for the, the four correctional facilities, four borough-based jails, not the five. And um, there's legislation that's pending up in Albany now for the governor's signature. And this would be for any library or, or cultural project over 1.2 million. Um, so it's very broad and we're hoping and we're, we're taking measures internally that if this does pass, we'll be ready to go. We have worked with New York Public Library and identified certain projects, scope of projects that we could utilize. We actually brought them in last week, some people from NYPL and the library systems um, and uh, for training from, an, uh, from a, an association in Washington, uh, Design Build Institute of America. So um, we're really um, at the forefront uh, for when this does get signed off. Got it. So once, uh, well, assuming uh, the governor signs, uh, then library projects will be identified to be uh, uh, absorbed into design build. Correct. And if I just uh, could say one other thing is that we, we had a, an open house uh, two days ago where we're really hoping to have a more robust uh, pre-qualified listing of firms. So that way we, we know at the onset, we already do the investigations into the firms before they bid. So that way there's no delay with a potential low bidder that is not reasonable or that may have um, other issues with uh, financial and what have you. So um, we're really looking to, we had over 320 uh, firms there and we're hoping to, uh, to expand our PQL as well. Uh, of course, I have to ask you at least one question directly on Hunter's point. 
Uh, the uh, flashing issue, obviously we know that there's still work going on uh, on the, uh, the roof. When is that going to be done? So the, um, there's, there's two issues, and one is, um, as, as Dennis had indicated, that's being repaired now. As far as the, the flashing on the roof, it was just at the doorway where there's actually the shoe where, the, where, the, um, where there was some ponding collecting. Uh, the contract is on site there doing that work now. Um, and I, you know, uh, we're very, very proud of the building that we had. Um, and literally, as we were going through our testimony last week, we had 30,000, right? And now uh, Mr. Walcott said 35,000 within, you know, 5,000 in the last week. So um, we find this is a success. There are, there will be punch list items. We have 450 active projects throughout the city right now, and each and every one of these will have corrective measures that need to be addressed at the end of the job. Um, this is the world that we live in, the world that I, that, and we, we look to reduce that during construction, but there will be corrective measures that are done um, after the projects are open. Uh, I, I uh, respect everything you said, but I, didn't hear you answer the question about when the work on the roof would be complete. So, uh, with I would say within a week, they started today, so in approximately a week. It was just at the door jam, so it wasn't significant. It's that's relating to the, the leak. That's related to the leak. Yeah, the other one is the, the railing is on site, and as soon as the weather breaks, they'll be doing, they'll be uh, just an extension of the railing for the rooftop. My and apologies then, for that. Right. No worries. And then, uh, and then the roof work and the outdoor seating area will be complete, substantially complete? It'll be substantially complete, it'll be invested, it'll be reviewed by DOB, and then it'll be turned over to uh, Queens Library. Right, and obviously probably for public use in the fall, in the spring, uh, as the weather gets nicer again. Um, uh, and our, so I just want to say also, I, I too agree that uh, while uh, it, it was a painful process, took a very long time. Mm -hmm. I have more gray hair today because <laughs> of that library uh, than perhaps I would have normally had. But uh, it is a remarkable success uh, given how many people have come uh, to use it in the first month. And, uh, and I know that there are growing pains and, and uh, kinks that have to work out, but I, I also believe uh, that uh, what we did there was important and special and unique and will benefit generations of, of uh, folks in Long Island City and, and greater Queens. Um, we just need to do it more quickly <laughs> and more efficiently going forward, uh, which is, of course, what you all are charged with doing. Uh, so I know uh, you waited uh, a bit. Again, I apologize for the delay. We respect you and your time, and uh, I will ask uh, and no more questions, uh, so you can get on with your day, and we will continue with the uh, Cuba resolution uh, hearing. So thank you very much, Commissioner Foley, Mr. Heller, and we will obviously continue talking about this. Thank you. So we're going to continue hearing testimony on uh, Councilwoman uh, Barron's resolution 1092. See if folks are still here. Dr. Damian Suarez, is Dr. Damian Suarez here? Yep. Come forward, Dr. Suarez. Uh, Pat, is it Fru? Fry. Fry, sorry about that. Your Y was uh, confusing me there. Uh, is Emily Thomas here? Emily, Mrs. Thomas? And it looks like Tol Gogan is Tol. Tal? Great, okay, that's the next grouping of four. And then we have Looks like two more panels. Uh, we're going to stick to the four, uh, the two-minute uh, testimony. And again, we'll start, I think, with Dr. Suarez on this panel as soon as Tal uh, is ready. <coughs> Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Damian Suarez. I'm originally from the Bronx. In 2007, I applied for a scholarship uh, program through the New York Interreligious Foundation for a Community Organization, or IFCO, which was recruiting applicants and notifying them of, a of full scholarship offers from the people of Cuba to young women and men from the United States that wanted to pursue a medical career. Our only commitment was to return to our communities and serve. I accepted a, 
I was accepted from 2008 until my graduation in 2015. I lived and studied in Cuba where I earned an MD. I graduated, graduated owing no debt thanks to the solidarity of the Cuban people and its government. The Cuban healthcare system is a model of healthcare that succeeds in resource poor places, prevailing despite an unjust embargo being imposed on it. This very model is currently benefiting the people of New York City who seek medical care at Jacoby Medical Center, Montefiore Medical Center, Harlem Hospital, Lincoln Hospital, Wyckoff Medical Center, Woodhall Medical Center, SUNY Downstate Medical Center, and Bronx Lebanon Hospital, where they receive treatment by my fellow graduates of Cuba's Escuela Latinoamericana de Medicina, the Latin American School of Medicine. The embargo, meant to punish the Cuban government, in reality punishes Cuba's people, as well as the almost 100 US citizens studying medicine in Cuba, young US citizens from diverse backgrounds like myself, who hope to return to their communities and provide quality health care for everyone. Restricting the trade of goods, commerce, and the movement of people hurts families both here in the U.S. and in Cuba, and limits our freedoms as U.S. citizens to move freely beyond our borders. I call for the end of the embargo and blockade against Cuba and the lifting of the travel ban. I applaud Council Members uh, Barron, Rodriguez, and Van Bramer for having the courage to bring Resolution 1092 before this committee, and I encourage every member of the New York City Council to support this symbolic le le legislation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suarez. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pat Fry, and uh, I thank the council members to bring this, um, bringing this uh, resolution forward. I'm here representing two organizations that I work with, the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism and the Alliance for Global Justice. I, <clears throat> I have worked to end this illegal and inhumane blockade of Cuba ever since I first visited the country in 1972. I went with a group of 200 Americans to express our opposition to the U.S. foreign policy that was attempting to overthrow the government of Cuba. We helped to build new houses for a dairy farm outside of Havana. This was 13 years after the Cuban people overthrew the brutal military dictatorship of Batista a regime supported by the U.S. government and the U.S. corporations that had long profited off the misery of the people. In April of this year, I went to uh, Venezuela with a small group of U.S. and Canadian citizens to see for ourselves up front the dire conditions of the country there, caused mainly by U.S. sanctions also and the illegal seizure of that country's oil and gold reserves. In the morning of April 30th, I awoke to gunfire surrounding our hotel. A coup d'etat was underway. It failed miserably and was over within two hours. Uh, the, the, it, that coup d'etat, the attempted coup d'etat, was organized by the Trump administration and paid for by our U.S. tax dollars. The Trump administration used that failure of that coup d'etat against the Maduro government to issue more sanctions, more incredibly new tightening of the, of the embargo against Cuba as an excuse, saying that Cubans had military personnel in Cuba. Anyway, I just wanted to just quickly say that there were no military personnel in Cuba. There were only doctors and, and agricultural workers and um, our tax money should go to fund our libraries, our schools, our worn out transportation system, a new African American museum, as we heard earlier, and our cities struggling with their budgets. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name's Emily Thomas, and I'm a volunteer with IFCO Pastors for Peace that sent the doctors to Cuba. Um, and I also own an eight-family apartment house in downtown Brooklyn, so I pay a lot of property taxes, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here because I'm part of the White Rose Ministry at the Presbyterian Church in Brooklyn Heights. And in fact, I'm wearing the T-shirt that we wore marching in the Pride Parade in Havana during the National Week Against Homophobia back in 2010. We took our name, White Rose, from the poem written by Jose Marti, a poem that every Cuban schoolchild knows. Marti wrote that he gives a white rose to his friends, 
but to those who tear out the heart by which he lives. To them also he gives a white rose. I'm here today to support Bill 1092, in which we ask our president to stop tearing out the heart of other countries, particularly Cuba. Our church has been in partnership with the Presbyterian Church and two ecumenical projects in Cuba for over 20 years. We've learned from them, we've helped them, we've grown together. I've got a lot of stories. One of our ongoing projects is to fund a feeding program that our sister church runs. With $3,750 that we send them every year, they are able to give lunch five days a week to 14 senior citizens who live in the neighborhood of the church, who live alone. This year, they ran out of money for food. Because of the new economic pressures that the Trump administration is applying for, to Cuba, the price of food has gone up. What about the others? I'll skip about the health and talk about, as Presbyterians, we're talk about being called. We're called by our religious teachings, our moral judgment, we're called to be better than this. Passing this bill is a step on the path to rectifying a wrong, cleansing a sin. We urge you not only pass the bill, but come to Cuba, talk to people there, see for yourself what their life is like under the sanctions. Bring white roses. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tom Gogan, and I am the interim chair of the New York City chapter of U.S. Labor Against the War. I'm also a UAW Local 1981 member. Uh, we work with labor organizations here and around the country to promote strong working class unity and uh, <clears throat> to end the seemingly endless wars promoted by our federal government and the military industrial complex. We commend you, Councilman uh, Member Bra Ben Bremer. I apologize for misspelling your name. Right. And also uh, uh, commend uh, council members uh, Barron and Rodriguez for sponsoring this legislation. We, we believe a hyper-militarized foreign policy is costly and counterproductive and that our country needs to stop its endless wars and interventions and focus instead on the true national security needs of our people. In other words, our government must instead focus on and provide for decent food, housing, health care, education, libraries included, transportation, environmental protection. It must aid and enhance our basic social and cultural needs in order to create a fully sustainable and equitable economy and productive life for all. Our government has sought to undermine the triumphs of the Cuban Revolution by punishing Cuban workers through a commercial, economic, and financial blockade for six long decades, despite 73% of U.S. citizens' support of lifting the, the blockade. Cuba is not our enemy. The Cuban people are our fellow workers, friends, and neighbors. The blockade prohibits U.S. workers from exercising their right to freely travel to Cuba and to forge worker-to-worker -worker ties. If the blockade were lifted, it would create jobs for U.S. workers and increase trade in agricultural products for farmers among other economic benefits. U.S. Labor Against the War condemns the Trump administration's travel restriction policies and the prolonged brutal blockade and sanctions against the Cuban people. Despite the limited resources in food, medicine, and trade opportunities due to the blockade, the Cuban Revolution remains a beacon of hope for workers everywhere and has accomplished some of the highest literacy rates and health conditions in the world. We support Resolution 1092 wholeheartedly and call for its immediate passage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so first I want to say uh, thank you uh, to all of the folks who mentioned libraries and uh, support of cultural, knowing that that is my life's work uh, uh, and uh, linking the two, which is very important to me. And there's no question in my mind 
that this uh, a foolish embargo only seeks to hurt the people uh, of Cuba. And I have not been to Cuba, but I very much want to go uh, and, and will go. And obviously, we shouldn't have to jump through silly hoops uh, to go uh, to Cuba. So uh, I want to thank all of you as well for being here and for your advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to hear from uh, another panel is uh, Sapphire Ahmed. Sapphire. Stephen Millies. Is Stephen Millies, did I say that right? Okay. Uh, um, is it Kathy Carlson? Okay. Uh, Yamir. Yamir is here. Great. And uh, let's call one more. Is, uh, is Shawana Vaughn? Shawana? Okay. And then we have one more, I think. Shernice? Gatewood Ali, and then we have a, is Matthew is, a, is still here? Okay, we're gonna hear from you uh, after, but there's, right? Sharnice, you're the last person to testify on Cuba, so why don't you join this panel and then we can uh, close it out with Matthew, which is back to libraries. Um, all right, can we add a fifth chair just so we can end with the last panel on the Cuba resolution? So why don't we start again uh, for my left, your right, and then we'll go down. Uh, yep, you're up first. Is the red light on before you? If you click it. I'm Dr. Sapphire Ahmed, who became a physician thinking by now that my country would have a health care system that delivered the human right for health care to all Americans. Uh, we don't still, but Cuba does. So it has a special place in my heart. Uh, I would like to say that Cuba is a multi-ethnic population of predominantly people of colors who have done just what the U.S., American, European leaders have always advocated for peoples of color to do. They have pulled themselves up with their shoestrings. So why is this gigantic empire like Goliath, supported by our taxes, consistently aiming to starve the Cuban people of medicines for treating asthma, diabetes, infections, high blood pressure, et cetera? Why does the United States persist in implementing laws aimed at stifling the social and economic development of the small nation? Why is the United States with its global might oppressing the people of Cuba when Cuba is not a terrorist nation, as are some nations that our, governments be, our government befriends? I submit to you that the U.S. government should let the people of Cuba develop. The Cuban <coughs> people, nor we Americans, want to return to a situation when only or primarily the European ethnic and wealthy Cubans and the mafia secured few, full human rights and prospered in Cuba. Rather, Cuba pe the Cuban people should be honored for exceeding the U.S. empire in terms of reducing racial, ed educational, health care, and economic disparities. Finally, Cuba has, in fact, so much to offer the United States in the area of functioning demo democratic community-based political structures, health care, and education. Furthermore, if beautiful beaches are the pre preoccupation of this current president, Cuban beaches are so much closer than those of Greenland for the average American to visit. Thus, if the people of the United States condemn bullying, we sh must demand that our representatives end the inhumane and unjust harassment of the Cuban people. Thank you. Please pass Resolution 1092, and thank you for sponsoring. Thank you. My name is Stephen Millies. I'm a retired Amtrak worker and member of both the uh, Transportation Communications International Union 
and the American Train Dispatchers Union. Uh, 16 of those years on the railroad I spent at Sunnyside Yard, and I'm speaking in support of Resolution 1092. About 20 years ago, two of my workers died, tragically died, of meningitis. The people of Cuba have developed a vaccine against meningitis. In fact, they've developed 33 vaccines. Many of these are not available in the United States because of the cruel blockade of Cuba that has cost the Cuban people at least $140 billion. This is criminal. And we should, we should reinstate just normal relations, state-to-state -state relations, just as President Obama reestablished diplomatic relations that people can travel to Cuba. That's a blockade against working and poor people in the United States that want to travel, that want to interact with the Cuban people. So I hope this resolution 1092 gets passed. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Yamil Chabur. Um, I'm a Colombian American, first generation born. I am from Queens. Um, oh, I'm from Queens as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so this year was my first year going to Cuba. I went with the Venceremos Brigade, which is a brigade that for 50 years have sent U.S. citizens to Cuba to do agricultural work in solidarity with the Cuban people and as in protest against the criminal Cuban blockade, which impedes Cuba of trading with other nations around the world or as well as Latin American nations. I remember speaking with Cubans and t like them explaining to me the fact that like they would like to trade with a company in Mexico, but if that company has 1% US ownership, then they cannot trade with that company for medical supplies. And I feel like this is criminal in a way that Cuba is a sovereign nation and they fought for that sovereignty and us in the United States who are the pronosticators of democracy are impeding on somebody else's sovereignty just because we couldn't build casinos. Because the grand legacy of the Cuban Revolution is the fact that Cuba will never be nobody's casinos because Cuba belongs to its, to its artists, to its musicians, to its doctors, to its teachers, and to its children. <laughs> And we here in the United States needs to respect that. Also the fact too that me being also into hip hop, I also got to like, um, I got to connect with a lot of hip hop artists out there. So that was dope as well, knowing the fact that New York City is the birthplace of hip hop and the way me as a New Yorker, I was able to, com to connect with the Cuban people. So I support Resolution 1092. Uh, Thank you. And as a Queens kid, I just want to say thank you. You're the first person to mention that you're from Queens, uh, <laughs> which makes your testimony just a little bit better than everybody else's. <laughs> Just joking. Um, but uh, now I know the next two, uh, I'm just told, right, uh, Sharnice and Shawana are going to talk about the introduction. Um, and so I just want to be uh, clear that you are both going to be talking about introduction number four, 1451, uh, and that is Councilmember Cabrera's uh, introduction on the creation of. Uh, the task force to review the feasibility of creating the New York City Museum of African American History. So um, whoever wants to go first. Hi, my name is Shanice Gaywood Ali. I am the CEO of We Are Phenomenal Women, which is an organization, nonprofit organization for women who've gone through domestic violence. So I'm wearing my purple, today is the last day. Happy Halloween to those who celebrate it. But I would like to express my concerns. Well, actually it's something good because I went to Washington DC and I visited the museum and actually I brought um, a bus. And I think it was, I was happy, then I was sad at the same time, so I had mixed feelings, but I was happy to see my, what my ancestors had brought and um, contribute to this country. Now, if we bring it over here in, in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, wherever they want to build it, I think it would be a very good thing for our youth to visit because I would, 
education do not really um, express what we did, what our ancestors did. They um, more or less highlight the European style, and I think um, as African Americans, as Latinos and so on, need to see what we did for this country. So at the end of the day, I did write a couple of things, but I think I went off because I know we have, we um, pressed for time. Um, we need to know who made the baby buggy, W.H. Richardson. Henry T. Simpson, he made the cell phone. John L. Love made the pencil sharpener. J. Standard made the refrigerator. J. B. Winter made the fire escape, the ladder. Did anybody know that? This is what I'm saying. We need to bring this museum into our country. We need to have it here. Have it here for us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shawana Vaughn. I am the director of Silent Cry, and I do mass incarceration and gun violence prevention. And so, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Councilman Cabrera um, for this wonderful vision. And um, this museum is vital, and it is not a dream of something that is going to happen far from now. And so I think that we've watched in this country right now, we have approximately 138 African American museums in 37 states. But New York is the epicenter of the United States. And if we are multicultural and we lead in sanctuaries and we lead in being a model of people to follow, then we need a museum that looks like what we say. And so I believe that not only do we need this museum, we're going to have this museum because our school system is disenfranchising young people of education that is other than Europe descent. And so because we are disenfranchising my children and my children's children, then we need to create something and create space where they have these learning opportunities, not just for a day. We shouldn't have to go to Washington, D.C. We are the epicenter, and this museum has to be in the epicenter of the world, which is New York City. And so we're going to stand on what we say, and we're going to put an African-American museum in this great city so this great nation can receive what it deserves. And we are talking about the five million people that have been in Washington, D.C., and we've talked about the currency that that brings. Let's talk about the wholeness that that brings. Mm -hmm. Because yes, there's a value of dollars, and yes, we need a task force to see what that is, but as a mother, as somebody who believes in community, we have to stand on the shoulders of Harriet Tubman and Nat Turner and the Cubans and everybody else. And that means that you assign a task force to see how much this cost and to see how fast we can get it built. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all of you. That concludes all the testimony on the two pieces of legislation uh, that were heard today. I support wholeheartedly both of them. I look forward to working to move both of them, and uh, both of them should happen. So I want to thank all of you for coming forward uh, today. Thank, thank you. you very much. We do have one last person, though, who would like to talk about libraries, uh, and that's Matthew Dr Zadrozny, uh, who uh, will talk about libraries, if you would like to say for that. Matthew. Is this working? Yes, it is. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Matthew Zadrozny. I'm the president of SaveNYPL.org, an all-volunteer group. 
We saved the Mid-Manhattan branch, which Iris Weinstein was showcasing from being sold. We saved the historic book stacks at the Central Library, which hold up the main reading room from being gutted. We prevented the NYPL from wasting millions of dollars and digging a money pit like the one Cooper Union's trustees buried their students in. Now NYPL wants to spend millions smashing a landmarked window in the South Court and carving up the marble walls of the North-South Gallery at the Central Library. These changes are intended to allow tourists to exit through a supersized gift shop and caterers to swiftly service private parties and weddings. They have nothing to do with the NYPL's mission. Nowhere in the NYPL's charter is there a provision for a bar service. The Central Library on 42nd and 5th was built on city land with taxpayer money and is owned by the City of New York. NYPL's contract with the city requires it to keep the Central Library open at least 80 hours per week. For the first six decades of its existence after it opened, the Central Library was open to the public an average of 87 hours per week. Now, NYPL Central Library is open less than 55 hours each week. Three nights a week, Monday through Friday, it closes before 6 p.m. when most students are getting off school and most working New Yorkers are leaving work. On Sundays, the day most New Yorkers are free, it's open only 3.75 hours, and in summers, it is closed. Mr. Chairman, such stingy hours are all the more unfortunate given that NYPL's cash-strapped peer, the Queen's Public Library, only opens three of 66 branches on Sundays, and the Brooklyn Public Library opens only six of 60 branches. Longer hours aren't sexy. Longer hours don't provide ribbons to cut or trophies to parade. Longer hours provide a quiet, safe space for students to study, researchers to write books, freelancers to work, and inventors to create. By contrast, short hours cut into education and earnings. That is why several thousand New Yorkers have signed our petition demanding longer hours at the Central Library. As Matthew. NYPL told the Council in March, libraries open doors, but not if they're closed. So, hey, Matthew, don't, don't let up? NYPL spend millions desecrating the People's Palace. Instead, compel the NYPL to honor its contract with the city and keep the Central Library open at least 80 hours per week. Tell the NYPL, serve readers, not cocktails. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, I, I know you've been before the committee before. I, as someone who's uh, dedicated my life to libraries, uh, uh, appreciate and respect your advocacy. Uh, and I agree with you that there are a few things more important than expanding library hours and days of service, something we worked very hard to do. When I first became the chair, we were down to five. Uh, so we have expanded them, but we need to expand them more. I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, this hearing is adjourned.